Though A Song of Ice and Fire is a fantasy series, there are elements of other genres present as well. Perhaps the most prominent is horror. It starts right away with the prologue, a chapter that could probably work as a standalone short story. In that prologue, we feel the fear building within Will until it peaks when he sees the others. It's not just the fear of death. He's faced that before, though it is clearly present. It's not like it's not important. But it's the fear of something that should not be. A thing that shouldn't exist. This is what he's never seen before, and Will grapples with that as he's frozen in place, clinging to the tree. What he's seeing is outside his reality, yet he cannot deny that it's happening. In A Clash of Kings, we meet a man who claims to worship these beings. Though maybe worship isn't the right exact word. He calls them by another name, too, the cold gods. So worship that maybe isn't worship, others that aren't actually other. Anyway, for this, he considers himself a godly man. He says it a lot. (laughs) This despite his blatant practice of incest, which is very much not godly in the eyes of most northerners and most southerners, too, really. The old gods don't really approve of incest. And the old gods and the cold gods are not the same, though. So we'll get into that. There can be no doubt that the way he treats his wives slash daughters is an abomination, both to us and most people in the story, in the world. Other free folk don't seem to like him, though his shelter has saved the lives of many a Night's Watch ranger, which, to be fair, might be part of why other free folk don't like him. Despite how horrible the man is, he's an extremely unique individual with knowledge that we have a great interest in thanks to the overlying mysteries of the story. There's really no one else like him. The revulsion we feel for him is oddly matched by our curiosity, something that only an expert writer like George R. R. Martin can pull off. Does he actually sacrifice to the others because he wants to? Because he thinks he has to? Somewhere in between? What happens to the children he leaves out in the snow for them? Are they just dead, or is it like one of his wives says, that they become the others themselves? Did he start this before? Did he learn this from somebody? Where did this come from? We haven't seen it from anyone else, so it's a, yet another big question. The only other people we've heard of treating the others as gods have lived in times far, far gone, such as Night's King. I mean, that's quite a company to be in. So we've got a lot to talk about today. We've got all that and more on this episode of History of Westeros podcast. Hello and welcome, everybody. Time for a creepy, fun episode. It's always neat to see how people react to a topic like this. Craster is undeniably gross, but this topic was easily won the poll <laughs> when we put it up against some other Shame. ones there. Shame. <laughs> so, gross doesn't mean uninteresting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're totally right. So, how you doing today, Sean? You got a? I see you got a Star Wars Futurama Simpsons mashup there. <laughs> Yeah, kind of in a tribute to the new Futurama season that came out. That's right. How many times has it been canceled and and brought back now? I think it was technically just been canceled twice, but then like some of the times it was brought back was for like multiple movies, so like it seemed like multiple more run. Like, but I think it's technically twice. Okay, okay, that's interesting. It might be. It seems like more. It's 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 another another thing of semantics. What's worship versus? (laughs) <laughs> something what's you know, cancel, cancel and, versus discontinued yeah. versus switch networks Inter- versus... indefinitely paused yeah <laughs> or mm-hmm. yeah what, what's there either way it's it's an unusual run for any show to have that is futurama but yeah all three of us like it shout out to our oh go ahead i i wanted to say real quick the um you know you started off the intro with the idea that fundamentally this story is fantasy like if you had to categorize it as one thing fantasy might be it right but there's definitely other elements to it political intrigue you know, drama uh and as you said horror maybe the the next most after fantasy but i think mystery okay. i think mystery is right up there with horror that's a good one yeah yeah because there's a lot of like whodunits that we don't yeah. know the answer to and a lot yeah. of other yeah i mean it literally mysteries. the first book in particular like starts as like being this mis- this murder mystery that ned is like trying to solve so i think the first true. one more than anything like sets up that it's like about a mystery that's and then there's like point. lots of then there's all these other mysteries that aren't as Front and center, really, but yeah. still other ones like Danny dealing with like who the harpy is, or not to mention who Ned's investigating murder. So is Catelyn. Like Catelyn yeah. starts like who tried to kill Bran, and then yeah, Ned's like who tried to kill John, who killed, who did kill John Aaron, yeah. and then yeah, that's a good and point. Often mystery and horror go hand in hand. That's true. 
Once again, including us, even at opening scene. What the hell Hunter are those things? Is also setting up a mystery, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what do they want? And Craster himself, we just talked about all the questions that come up with him, you know. Yeah. So. That's a great point, yeah. So, yeah, mystery, it's, it's, a, that's a, there's a strong case that it might actually supersede horror in this series. I don't know how you would go about quantifying that, but it's a strong point. Regardless, shout out to our friend Nina. She added a, quite a lot of notes for this one. Uh, she always adds solid thoughts to our episodes. This one is is notable for even more than usual uh, considering so. it's like that's less surprising to me when it's like a certain historical topic or something like that but when it's crashed i'm like oh okay you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> she's the same kind of reaction like this guy is creepy but yep there's a lot to say there's a lot of uh, analysis and, and mystery and Latest on goodqueenally.tumblr.com, that's of course one L in alley, is a post on responding to a question on what kind of rights would divorced noble women have in Westeros. Uh, several different permutations on this, such as what about setting aside a wife who's infertile, or you know, like, do they have, is it still a responsibility for the husband or the family, or what's, how does it work, basically? And though there isn't a ton of detail in the books, you need to put together what she can. So that's pretty cool. Check that out if you're so inclined. This episode was voted on by patrons, like I said. They won more than half of the vote for four different choices. And next week, we're on the road. We'll have a uh, older episode put up. Some of y'all may not have seen it. So just keep an eye on your feeds. And the yeah, next we're going to Chicago, y'all. That's right. We are going to Chi-Town. We're going to see uh, Tommy Pappas, a yeah. uh, friend of the show. I can't believe you're going to Chicago without having watched The Bear. <laughs> <laughs> the Bears. If this episode ends and you want to stay immersed, we've got you covered with suggestions for topics related to this one. And, well, that's the last time I'll say that in a while because, well, maybe not. I'll still be saying that. I'll take that back. I was going to say we're starting Valar Readers for Fire and Blood, but there'll definitely be yeah, things tons. that come up that'll be like, we've got a whole episode on yeah, that. So I don't will. know what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We absolutely will keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't have as many, uh, we won't have votes for a while, episode votes for a while. Trivia question. Who does Jon Snow see sleep inside the hollow of a tree? Answer at the end. It's maybe this is what inspires him to go in a cave with a grit. No, actually, no, but <laughs> it's kind of like a cave. It's very small and made of wood. And it's not a werewood tree, in case you're wondering. It's just a tree, some large tree. Set up. Let's talk about a little. Because a large person, huh? <laughs> <laughs> mm, could be, could be. There's a fishing village. We're going to start and end this episode with some inspiration. First, real-world inspiration. At the end, Nina wrote a nice little piece on a parallel to George R. R. Martin's story, Fever Dream, which is his you know, vampire Mississippi riverboat novel, which is a very good story that I have been meaning to reread. There's a fishing village in Northumberland, that's England, if you've forgotten, called Craster. And Craster Kippers, which is smoked herring, are known around the world. The ones made there. Uh, the village is not far from Dunstanburg Castle. Now, we've talked about Dunstanburg Castle in Manderley Part 1. Because it's likely the inspiration for Dunstanbury Castle. The people that held Dunstanburg had a similar story that the Manderleys did, where they were forced to flee. Uh, they exiled themselves because of a situation. And yeah, anyway, well, we go into that in the Manderley episode. So check that out. But... George has been there, and the Craster, like, if you're walking, if you're at Craster Village and you're walking along this causeway, you'll get to Dunstanbury in, like, a short amount of time. It's visible from there. So, since George has been to Dunstanbury, there's a very good chance he's heard of this Craster Village. The Craster family has held the village since the 11th century. Whoa, right? <laughs> I, don't know if I don't know if they're incestuous. I, probably not, but hey, you know, they've been there a while. What's more... Craster in Anglo-Saxon means crow's camp or crow's earthwork. Mm. How crazy is that? So that's almost certainly something George borrowed from because that's too much of a coincidence, I think. Craster has a strange relationship with crows, of course. The Night's Watch crows, that is. He hates them, yet he gives them shelter. His father was a ranger, so there's some definite like human pathos here that will talk about as well as a lot of the other great topics that are associated with this first mention and we like to start with that when we have a character especially or an obscure thing because crasher's keep has been so valuable to the night's watch as a shelter the rangers have put up with quite a lot 
knowing what kind of man he is, makes lines like this one very awkward. Quote. Up ahead, a hunting horn sounded a quavering note, half drowned beneath the constant patter of the rain. Buckwell's horn, the old bear announced. The gods are good. Crash is still there. His raven gave a single flap of his big wings, croaked, Corn! and ruffled his feathers up again. John had often heard the Black Brothers tell tales of Craster and his keep. Now he would see it with his own eyes. After seven empty villages, they had all come to dread finding Crasters as dead and desolate as the rest, but it seemed they would be spared that. Perhaps the old bear will finally get some answers, he thought. Anyway, we'll be out of the rain. That's a Clash of Kings John 3. So you see what I mean about that being awkward? They're like, whew, Craster's still there. And yes, it's because of the shelter, but they have their the empty villages gave them shelter too. It's, why is he still there? That's the part that's really awkward because he, as he explains it, it's because he's right with the gods and that involves doing all sorts of sacrifices and, and other stuff. So yeah, that's pretty awkward. A Game of Thrones ends with Jon trying to desert, getting brought back by his friends, and then G.R. Mormont scolding him and pointing out that their war is more important than Rob's. And, and Jon is kind of struck by that, like, that's a good point, man. <laughs> he said, and then he announces that they're going by the, going by the wall, and he's like, oh, okay, dang, we are, we are going off into adventure. I am going to be a ranger, sort of, after all. It's not exactly what he expected, though, is it? Mm, and here they are, three chapters into that great ranging. That's what that quote, uh, where that quote falls. Nina says, isn't that quote immediately ominous and menacing? In a world of death and desolation, Crasher not only survives, but doesn't want to leave. He's like, yeah, I'm cool here. <laughs> this is like this awful landscape, desolate, cold, freezing. Yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> Mormont treats it as a good sign. Uh, but as I've said, and <laughs> it's, we should be scared of the fact that he's still there. It should be a problem. Like, why is he able to remain? What does he know that they don't? What is he doing? Right. And well, they don't, maybe don't fully grasp. Maybe they don't want to know. Maybe they haven't admitted it to themselves, but John, people like John, well, John's, uh, has that combination of naivete and strong sense of justice built into him from ned and it's something you see in a lot in aria in particular a lot of the starks really but i think those two really stand out the most of just being really stubborn in their ways about what's good and isn't and ned stark was kind of like that too so nina says as well anyone who's watched a horror movie knows that that creepy isolated cabin in the woods never leads to good things like this is <laughs> this is a horror trope <laughs> it's like and it's not and now he plays with it, as he always does. But this part of it is pretty straightforward. <laughs> like, just the abandoned, everything else is abandoned, but one creepy dude is there. Yeah, well, and his wife. Here, I would say, rather than play with it, he's taking advantage of it. Okay, yeah, right? he's leaning into it, yeah. He's playing off <laughs> what people are going to assume. Like, you're right to assume that. This is horrific. <laughs> Here's how a veteran ranger. Now, Thorin Smallwood is this next quote here. He is not a newbie. He is no Jon Snow. He's been in the watch for a long time. Thorin Smallwood swore that Craster was a friend to the Watch, despite his unsavory reputation. The man's half mad, I won't deny it, he told the old bear. Oh. The man's half mad, I won't deny it, he told the old bear. But you'd be the same if you'd spent your life in this cursed wood. Even so, he's never turned a ranger away from his fire, nor does he love Mance Raider. He'll give us good counsel. So long as he gives us a hot meal and a chance to dry our clothes, I'll be happy. Everyone's talking about how dry it is. That's an important... <laughs> like, woof, this rain. Yeah, I mean, I believe it. It's freezing, probably. That's got to be awful. I want to point out, it, it is, you know, in full context, so long as he gives us a hot meal and a chance to dry our clothes, I'll be happy. So so as long as he does that, anything else is fine. <laughs> Sacrificing babies, incest, <laughs> like, I, you know, maybe it hasn't been tested, but I wonder how far it would be tested. Yeah, mm, yeah, well, it, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, some yeah, of How, where it was, Thorin, of what he was doing, you know, like, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know, this... Uh, some of this troubles me. It'll be a theme throughout, I think. I, but in the same way that some of the, the Kingsguard have this sort of respect and reputation for their honor, but they stand by and watch kings do awful things. Yeah. Like, how much honor do they really have? That sometimes the Night's Watch is a little questionable. Yeah. I guess my yeah. question here is, um, do we see where what, what Thorin does in the, you know, drama at Craster's? 
He's killed. Uh, he's, he's killed before that. Before that, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was, I was he's, curious. He's killed like, at the fist of the first man. Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> he we replaces Benjamin as first ranger and goes on one ranging. I guess maybe he'd gone on one that. before. So we don't but. see him face that dilemma. No, he he's the one that he's killed by the undead bear. Mm. He like almost oh, takes its okay. head off and then it takes his head off. <laughs> it's because <laughs> taking its head off doesn't accomplish all that much. <laughs> <Doesn't affect> it, <laughs> yeah. But it does in Thorin's case. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that's actually probably where they got the idea to do the, the bear scene on the TV show, even though it's very different. But it does end up killing someone. It does end up <laughs> killing uh, what Thoros in the show dies like of his wounds because of that bear attack. Yeah, he dies a day or two later. Yeah. The wo- was it Thoros? Yeah, it was. yeah, 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 yeah. So obviously Thoros, Thorin. Hey, they kept it closer than I realized. Right? <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, because Thorin's not even in the show. Anyway, the show is not going to come up much today, but we will mention it one or two other times because imagery and uh, I wanted to talk about the actor briefly. Anyway, Nina says these words take on an extra sinister edge when you read them after second time around. Like when you hear it the first time, you don't yet know. Oh my god, like, oh, as long as he just gives us, like, you don't realize how far that, like Sean said, you don't realize how far that's being pushed. Like, oh, wow, so he's, maybe he's kind of a dirty guy. Maybe he's done a few bad things. No, this guy's sacrificing his sons to the others. This this, this isn't, like, basic criminal behavior. This is something far worse. And yeah, because he gives them shelter, that's that makes it okay. Not okay, but it means they have little choice, because, yes, shelter, in this case, it's not like, convenience it's not like oh we won't get wet at night it's the that's pointed out multiple times that it's the difference between life and death like they, if they had been out in the wilderness they would have died if they hadn't gotten inside crash they would have died so the bar is pretty high for what you'll tolerate when death is the alternative i gotta say even if it's extremely immoral like some people would be like i'd rather die than tolerate this but when you're actually put to the or- test you might not <laughs> And on some level, I see that, but also maybe you'd rather prepare better. Yeah, maybe sure. Bring one more horse with extra <laughs> firewood, something. You guys, you have other options. You yeah, know? like they didn't, like, he's like, oh, Craster has a fire. Like, you could have built your own fire. I mean, yeah, like you say, I mean, yeah, like, there are, because like you said, there's abandoned villages. All those other spots had empty hovels. They could have stayed there. Yeah. So, but. The Night Watch could have built their own outpost out there. They travel out there <laughs> often enough to need to stay at Craster's over and over again. Build your own little hut or whatever. Now, maybe it wouldn't last. Maybe wildlings would take it. You know, I, I mean, I could see all kinds of angles, but I got to run through all those angles before I live with this incestuous guy, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> I got to be sure about this, not just one guy. One ranger told me it's cool. Okay. And that's what John does. And he, I mean, he refuses to sleep under Craster's roof and refuses to eat his food. So, like, John at, at least... Maybe if John was more tested, like if it was freezing, literally freezing outside, he might not have, you know, I don't know. I don't know what John would, we just don't know what John would have done, but it it is hard to know what you do. (laughs) He might have accepted it that night so he didn't freeze and starve to death. And and then come back later. (laughs) Exactly. To exact justice, to free the women or whatever, you know. But But clearly none of these other rangers did, not including Benjamin, I suppose. Yeah. So... And this other line that Thorin Smallwood says, he says, he'll give us good counsel. Like, really? Interesting. Like, he does get, tell them where Mance is. So that is partly true. So that is a, definitely something that the Night's Watch got out of him that was very valuable and useful and accurate. Like, he didn't lie about that. But he did lie about other things, as we'll see. So it's not all, yeah, it's a mixed bag in terms of what he's saying there. So I don't think... Uh, there's some sort of reverse card being played here. People seem to know what Craster is, even though the readers are introduced to it slowly. And it's kind of through John's perspective. He doesn't know until he learns, but then he rhymes out. But yeah, these people have known this. Even the old bear knew this already. Uh, here's another quote about him from another Night's Watch source. Dywin said Craster was a kinslayer, liar, raper, and craven, and hinted that he trafficked with slavers and demons. And worse, the old forester would add, clacking his wooden teeth. There's a cold smell to that one, there is. Yeah, Dywin has the fifth sem- fifth sense. He can smell cry. I mean, no, he can smell the others or death or whatever it is he's smelling. It's, the, it's not the only time it comes up, and every time it seems to be accurate. So something's up with Dywin and his fifth sense there. He can smell things that other people can't. But he's never attributed to a person before. I don't think Dywin's ever attributed the cold smell to a human. It's always been like the others are near or the whites are near. And I'm pretty sure he's always been right. We've never done a full deep dive on Dywin. I've always kind of meant to. 
this maybe inspires it even more. But yeah, so that's like, yeah, the stink of the others is on him. Not that he is one, not that he's got their bloodlines or something crazy like that, although I suppose that can't be dismissed. There's no evidence for it either. Dywin's right on the money here, Nina says. Yeah, Craster, Clint, Kinslayer, yes. Liar, yes. Raper, yes. Craven, eh, maybe. That one I'm not as sure about, but I think you can make the case. Traffic with slavers and demons? Probably. Well, definitely the demons, and the demons might be slavers. <laughs> so pretty much all those things are true. It sounds like an exaggeration, though. When you put all those things together with a, in a character you haven't met, it's like, ah. Especially in this kind of story where... George does that sort of thing where he, you know, people spread rumors. The rumors go through the telephone game and get exaggerated. And a lot of times like, okay, it's not quite as intense as all that. This time, yeah, yeah, it pretty much is. So what are some things that he's lied about? Uh, well, let's, let's go through some of the examples specifically. He's a kinslayer because he's letting his own babies out to die. That's pretty straightforward. He's a liar because he said he's not seen the others. Yet later we'll go through evidence that proves he has, well, at least his... His wives have. Gilly has knew how to describe them. And that's before she saw them on page with Sam. So, and the other wives had indicated they've seen them as well. At least some of them, not all 19 of them. We didn't talk to all of them, or the Night's Watch didn't talk to all of them. So he's probably lying about that. He probably lied about uh, some other things that we'll get to as well. He is a raper, no doubt. I mean, his he rapes his wives. He's forced them. He marries them way young. Way young. Uh, and calls it a marriage. He Nina does make the case he's a craven. He would rather sacrifice to the others to save his own skin than risk resisting them, like fighting for the knights, watching like that. So yeah, so like I said, there's a case to be made that he's a craven. He does. I mean, he's not like a he's not a coward necessarily, but a craven. Like he does like stand up to people. He's you know go outs and hunts. He takes risks on his to his person. So there's a sense of that. But yes, he's. I think a it's moral fair to coward. say that someone. I think it's fair to say that someone who is generally brave might find something that is scary enough to be you know yeah. like a he might again i think it's debatable whether or not he's a craven yeah so i'd say in the case of like more morality and ethics i'd say he's a craven but in terms of like facing physical danger probably not um if you want to divide it that way your mileage may vary and he does traffic with slavers and demons as we just said so yeah nina makes pretty much the same case as we do here it's like yeah it's all very straightforward y'all it's not <laughs> it's not this isn't rocket science here joseph craft says the super chat says craster brendan rivers connection possibly probably coming we have it in here in fact it's in this next section because this next section is called birth we're talking about craster's background which it comes up a bit here let's let's go quote craster's more your kind than ours his father was a crow who stole a woman out of White Tree Village, but after he had her, he flew back to his wall. She went to Castle Black once to show the crow his son, but the brothers blew their horns and run her off. Craster's blood is black, and he bears a heavy curse. That last line in particular is interesting, and that's a grit speaking, in case it wasn't clear. For all the tuss. So she, all the t She went to the Castle Black, mm -hmm. yeah. The <laughs> White Tree is pretty close to the wall. They they pass through it on their way to Craster's Keep. So we see the village where he's from, where his mother was born or where she lived anyway. And that makes the connection simple enough through sheer proximity. We also know that various members of the Night's Watch do not take the prescription against sex very seriously. It's, it's one of the laws that they break routinely. Not all of them, of course, but a lot of them, maybe even the majority, perhaps probably the majority. I don't know. Uh, there's a continued sex trade at Molestown. And of course you got stuff like this going on as well with, with, rangers hooking up with free folk uh, willingly or otherwise anyone could have fathered craster nina says it's not necessarily meant to be important who it is i think that's kind of it's meant to be kind of a faceless anybody i think that maybe it, it makes the story a little better makes it fit a little better but we are uh, but we are going to entertain these other possibilities because we don't know uh, his blood is black is what she says egret that's because she's a born of the Night's Watch, black blood, but also the Harvey Curse part. <laughs> that's basically the same things we were just saying. Kin slaying, incest, sacrifice. Like, yeah, that's, I think that's what she means. I don't know exactly. She didn't elaborate exactly, but I think that's it. So, yeah, there is a blood raven as Craster's theory out there. It's been there for a long time. There's really nothing to back it up other than it being technically possible. I, in fact, think there's counter evidence. Like, if it was someone famous like him, that would be hard to keep under wraps. It would have been known, I think. So I lean pretty heavily towards a no on Bloodraven. 
But that doesn't mean there isn't a reason to bring him up under a different uh, subject here because, well, we'll get to it in a minute. First of all, here we see White Tree. Oh, Sean's got a point. I want to say I, I lean towards no also, but I do think there is an argument. I, I think there is the fact that there is so much mystery surrounding him. Yeah. Like we, we started saying, like, when did he start sacrificing the babies? How does he know he needs to do it? Things like this. Blood Raven is mysterious and in the know enough that he might have been part of setting that up. We don't have another good angle for how that got set up. Blood Raven is a good angle. It doesn't mean that's what it yeah. was. And there is evidence against it still. But I see where the theories come You're right. From. That is a... That people would come up with that. Uh, the very few people that have information about this, Blood Raven is one of them. So it could make sense that someone connected to him might have a different like, view on it, but this with the same information that, that built their case or whatever. I think we lean against it and have good reason to lean against it now. But if it turned out to be the case, we won't be like, what? I can't believe it. There was nothing to set this up. Well, there was something to <laughs> set it up. There was something so. to set it up, yeah. So here is a nice lengthy quote about White Tree and the description of it. And I think it goes a long way towards showing, like, think about being born in this place and, and growing up in this environment and what that might do to your psyche. White Tree... The village was named on Sam's old maps. John did not think it much of a village. Four tumble-down, one-room houses of unmortared stone surrounded an empty sheepfold and a well. The houses were roofed with sod, the windows shuttered with ragged pieces of hide, and above them loomed the pale limbs and dark red leaves of a monstrous great werewood. It was the biggest tree John Snow had ever seen, the trunk near eight feet wide, the branches spreading so far that the entire village was shaded beneath their canopy. The size did not disturb him so much as the face, the mouth especially, no simple carved slash, but a jagged hollow large enough to swallow a sheep. Those are not sheep bones, though, nor is that a sheep's skull in the ashes. An old tree... Mormont sat, his horse frowning. Old, his raven agreed from his shoulder. Old, old, old. And powerful. John could feel the power. Could feel <laughs> I, the I, power. That's <laughs> dang. It makes me laugh a little bit. Feel the power. Feel the power. That tree is like, feel my power. But like. <laughs> You've got the touch. <laughs> <laughs> if Craster could feel the power or Craster's mother, like he grew up there. Like John just passes through and feels the power and is creeped out by that. What does it do to you to be born there? Like growing up under that tree. It's like the only f feature that's like really notable about the place that you would. I mean, how would you not just see it all the time? And ah. Instead of watching a horror movie, you just go sit in front of the tree. Yeah, I mean, geez. If you, I mean, it's notable that a man who feels, or f maybe feels that he has to, or chooses to make sacrifices to the cold gods was born in a place with the hugest werewood John has ever seen. I, mean, I think that's relevant. I don't know exactly how, but I feel like it's just that the imprint that would leave on a child would have, I don't know, it seems like that would have an impact, right? Parents out there, you agree, right? Mormont thinks the skulls were burned dead, not necessarily something more nefarious, like not a burned sacrifice, because for one thing, it may remind us of human sacrifice, which we know was done in the past, but and probably still is in some places in the north and elsewhere. But if we're sticking to the north, burning isn't how they do sacrifices. I mean, Melisandre does, but that's not how northerners do sacrifices. They do like in beheadings and blood spilling on the weirwood and entrails hanging in the in the elite limbs and all that it's not like this so it's so Gior's probably right that they're just burning their dead and and it's important to remember that they know why to burn their dead because well they walk and come after you if you don't do that so yeah it's probably not human sacrifice try that in a small village <laughs> <laughs> so this contextualizes Craster as someone who grew up kind of normalizing all the stuff. Either maybe it is sacrifice, maybe it seems like sacrifice, or maybe you it just seems normal. His hair is starting to go white, so he's probably in his 60s since it's starting to go white. That's usually how George writes that transition, and it's pretty pretty accurate, I guess. You go from gray to To be white. clear, not starting to go gray, because that happens yeah. before you're 60. Yeah, starting to go you. white. Yeah, the gray <laughs> is going white, yes. So that puts his birth in the early 240s or so which is around the same age as Tywin or Kevin or the Mad King. 
though I, again, doubt Blood Raven was his father, the ranger who was his father would have served under Blood Raven because Blood Raven was Lord Commander in 239. So very likely, unless Craster's a few years older than it would have been whoever the Lord Commander was prior to, right before Blood Raven. It may have been one of the Raven's Teeth. That would have been interesting. Uh, there were a lot of the Raven's Teeth at Castle Black. And just on sheer numbers, you know, there would have been like 50, maybe 60, maybe even more of them. So just on, you know, more odds than most. And uh, Blood Raven's last ranging was in 252. So Craster was probably still a young man living in White Tree. I.e. he didn't have his keep yet, probably. So whatever the value of Craster's keep as a shelter to the rangers wasn't there when Blood Raven was ranging. Maybe that's why he got lost on that last ranging. He didn't have Craster's keep to come back to for shelter. Uh -huh. But I wonder if there was maybe some other Maybe he established guy. it on his last range. <laughs> mm hmm maybe. And then maybe, uh, you know, then maybe Craster came and found it and took it over. No, he gave it to him. He's like, hey, son, you can have this now. <laughs> I don't maybe think he so. found it with him. He's like, hey, we need to do this thing. Oh, well, yeah. Trust me. <laughs> Robert's Rebellion. Yeah, so I, I, I would say yes that, like, Craster heard about Robert's Rebellion. But, like, you got to think even some of the big events in the Seven Kingdoms just wouldn't have made the news north of the wall unless it was really dramatic. Like Summer Hall, maybe, maybe not. You know, like a bunch of Targaryens dying in fire. My, that might spread all over. People might be like, even the, beyond the wall, they might hear that one. The War of Nine Penny Kings, maybe. But I think it's got to be pretty big news to go up beyond the wall, especially to a remote, super ultra rural area. Both rural and like tainted. Like no one wants to go there. It's both like isolated because the land isn't good, but also no one wants to live there because of that. But also no one wants to live there because you're like near him and all these other things. <laughs> A lot of reasons. Where was the Nine Penny Kings? I think of that as being like in the south end oh, of yeah. Westeros. Melis right? was slain Which... on the Stepstones. Like that's where their their yeah, invasion the was like yeah. a they they used that as like a jumping off point and they didn't get very far. That... It makes me feel like it's less likely, right? Something that happens, like, yeah. maybe in the Vale or in Winterfell, that, that'll make its way north. Well, the North did send something. its troops to the Nine to fight, so they would have maybe known okay. for that reason. Like, a lot of soldiers leaving the North would have... would have. That's... Oh, maybe maybe a good time for raiding, because of a lot of fighting men have left the North, mm -hmm. you know? So that's the kind of thing I think they might keep an eye on, for that, for that reason, because it matters to them. It's an opening... Uh, so it's a very small group, those born north of the wall to a free folk mother and ranger father. Of course, it has to be that pairing because there's no female rangers. Although it's not completely unique, right? There's a, no, a few other examples. Mance Raider himself is born of a ranger and a uh, free folk woman. Part of maybe why Craster doesn't like him because <clears throat> they have so much in common. But Mance is so much more accomplished. <laughs> People like him. Also, this, so that's one. That's one. Okay. The other is... The son of Bale the Bard, who took over, so the, the, all the, the Starks who descend from this. But that's that's like it. I don't know any others. Oh, just the two. Okay. Yeah, just those two. And Craster, <laughs> so three, yeah. <laughs> but we've got to, there's got to be others. Like, there's got to be plenty of other rangers who have impregnated plenty of other free folk women. We just don't know their names. Any of them. The child, the mother, or the father, right? But it's got to be plenty. Yeah. Uh, but there might be some other reason Mance is resented by Craster besides just regular jealousy or something like that. But Craster doesn't really like many people, so we can't read too much into this. Like, a guy who doesn't like anyone, liking one particular person, that doesn't really say much. <laughs> Nina guess there's a tint of jealousy, quite possible. Um, Mance never learned who his father was either, uh, but he was raised at Castle Black, so that might be a reason for jealousy. Mance was actually raised to be a ranger, whereas... When Craster's mother brought him there, it sounds like they didn't even give her a chance. It's because the way uh, the grid says they blew their horns and drove her off. Like they didn't even like open the gate or something. Like maybe they saw her coming and were like, Meh, wildling, one of them, like with a baby, like, ah, get her. You know, I don't know. Uh, Igrit wasn't there. So we don't know if that's exactly what happened. But <clears throat> I could see that being a, a reason for bitterness. They raised Mance. They didn't raise me from Craster's POV. So, um, <clears throat> I think there's also perhaps a sense in which Craster thinks Mance is being ridiculous with respect to the others. Osha speaks of Mance as a brave, sweet, stubborn man for thinking they can fight the others. Like the White Walkers were no more than rangers. That's a good point. Osha and her crew fled because they were like, this is dumb. Like, we're not going to, uniting all the free folk, 
great, amazing thing you can do, but uh, to, you, to fight the others that way, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to work. They can't be beaten by the weapons the wildlings have. Just, it's just that simple. So Craster might have might realize that he's like, yeah, this is just a big dumb plan that's just not going to work, and you're going to get a lot of people killed. And I don't know, not that he has a better plan, but well, he yeah, he does. He's like, everybody should sacrifice to them, and then we'll be fine. <laughs> okay. He has another plan, yeah. maybe not a better yeah. plan. He has a plan yeah. he thinks is better, but yeah, <laughs> surely he should realize how that won't work for everyone. <laughs> They're not yeah. willing to sacrifice their children. <laughs> also. Mance must have shifted gears at some point, right? It doesn't seem like he's on a mission to fight the others currently. No, he, so. you're right. He that's part of why he came to the wall. He's like, we need to, we want your. He wanted to make a deal with the Seven Kingdoms through strength. Say, look, we're gonna crush you unless you let us in and help, and we'll all fight the other. We want, we want the protection of the wall. But if you don't give it to us, we're gonna inflict damage on you. That was kind of like a, it's like a. He's got a carrot and a stick. Yes, or whatever. yes. Um, you're you're right. So that's something to remind ourselves when discussing the events of Craster's Keep. The first time, anyway, there's a lot more reason for superstition and for end times or new era is beginning because this is all happening under the shadow of the Red Comet. Pretty easy to forget that. The Red Comet's up there during all this, right? During this scene at Craster's, during the next few chapters, before these, it's all like that's the early part of the Clash of Kings. Everything is happening under the Red Comet. Everyone's constantly noticing it, making interpretations, some of them interesting, some of them silly, all of them interesting. Craster recognizes John's look. He's like, you look like a Stark. I'm not sure what other Stark he would have seen besides Benjen. There's definitely some possibilities because he's been there a while. Benjen probably wasn't the only Stark on the in the Night's Watch. There may have been, I mean, at, at that time he was, but go back 30 years and maybe there was some other Stark. I don't, I don't know. I, I had a couple of thoughts on that too. I wonder if Starks have a look in general. We think they do. We've we've even, gone on this before. We've talked right. about it before. I think, and, and and it would add to the idea of the others mistaking Raymore Rorse as a Stark, mm, okay. right? That maybe they thought he was Jon Snow or some other Stark, and like, oh, he's he because he looked like him. Oh, but that's not the right guy. <laughs> no. But if that's the case, they never came for John any other time. He was beyond the wall for months and months and months and months and months and months and months, and not once did they come for him. Like all that time, he was with the Free Folk, with Egret and. Well, I guess it, I don't. I shouldn't necessarily assume they were coming for him. They just encountered him, thought it might be him. Oh, and then realized it wasn't. It doesn't necessarily mean they're coming for him. But if they see him, they'll recognize him. That's my thought. Hmm, okay. Yeah, I guess it's possible. Um, if the Starks have a look and it's been around for a long time, then yeah, it's pretty much possible that anyone or anything could be aware of that. He says he hasn't seen Denjin in three years. Nina says, BS, <laughs> you haven't seen him in three years. That does not make sense. Let's go over the reasons why. Benjen was and is technically the first ranger. He's still acting. He hasn't officially been declared dead. It just doesn't look good. And while we don't know how long he was first ranger, it's he's been a ranger for the better part of two decades, or had been. Two decades. Craster's Keep isn't right next to the wall, but it's pretty close. Certainly close enough for Waymar Royce to stop there at his ranging, and Waymar refused to sleep under the, the roof there. But you're telling me that... The first ranger of the watch didn't check in at Craster's when he went to look for Waymar? Bull. <laughs> did this guy pass through here? In fact, he did because Craster says Waymar passed through there. You're really telling me Benjen didn't go check with Craster? Bull. <laughs> Unless he vanished before getting to Craster's, which is also very, very unlikely considering how close to the wall it is. Right? Like, it just doesn't, it does not add up. I, I have a counterpoint. Okay. Benjamin might avoid Craster just like John wants to. But why would he avoid like, it if he's looking for looking for people? <laughs> but, but that's that's so like in general I can see why. In he general, might go I agree, years, but in this Craster, case it does not make sense. Specific reason. So although I, and I don't know who Benjamin might have had with him, but he might have sent someone else. Like I don't want to see that man, but we need to check. You go check. Tell me what he says. Well, I mean, that's a possibility. Yeah. Right? I guess, but if he left with a very small group. I don't. Doesn't really. That doesn't really make sense either. Yeah. I mean, if they're yeah. This is not a hill I'm going to die on, yeah. but I'm saying it is a possibility. I agree, but it's very thin. It's very very thin. I don't. To me, it doesn't move the needle. I think, but clearly, Craster is lying, especially because he's lied about other things. We also have a good reason to think Benjen made it as far as the Fist of the First Men. He's very likely the one who left behind that Night's Watch package of of arrowheads, considering it was a fresh cloak and not an old cloak. And it also doesn't really make sense that. He went as far as that, and everyone talks about how Craster's is such a valuable 
place to you know rest and all that and we don't hear that benjamin shunned it there's no indication of that like benjamin specifically john asks G or Mormont, if he knew, and he's like, "Yes, all the Rangers knew." Yeah. So that includes. He Benjen. says all the Rangers knew, and John says even Benjamin and Mormont says all, all the Rangers. Right. Yeah. So that. we can't but even that, assume. Again, to Benjen me, that's the indication it. that. Right. Look, I don't want to assume it, but we see that John doesn't want to avoid it. Maybe Benjamin would have wanted to avoid it, and maybe Benjamin, especially in the direness of the current moment. Yeah. He just all right. My my troubles with. Craster aren't as important as saving humanity, so I guess I'll go deal with this guy. And the, but and the other reason would be then why would he have seen him three years ago? Why would he have come then if he was avoiding him when yeah, it wasn't dangerous? Ago, when there wasn't something. He just now, after scene. seventeen years as a ranger, has decided to stop. Yeah. yeah. So it, yeah, That's there's true. a lot of a lot of holes there. I mean, you're right that is there's still a, a thread of p- potential there, but yeah, he's most certainly lying. Uh, he also knows about Garrett's fate, which is interesting. Like he knew that Garrett ran off, and he knew that he would, had been executed. So another reason to to guess that he knew about or has seen Benjen, Nina says, Garrett was only executed after Waymar and his party disappeared because Gamar, uh, Garrett obviously, <laughs> Gamar, <laughs> combined Waymar and Garrett. That's cool. Gamar. Garrett, <laughs> yeah, there's there quite a ship there. They really didn't like each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it somehow it came around. And, enemies and, uh, to lovers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Garrett obviously deserted Waymar's party and the watch as a whole after the others killed Waymar and Will. Only someone who went to Craster's after Ned's execution of Garrett would have been able to tell Craster that Garrett was beheaded. How did Craster learn that Garrett was beheaded without talking to Rangers after that had happened? There's almost no way to, to, to know, especially because it was close to get like maybe like a five years passes and there's a lot of time for the rumor to spread in a lot of places and get back to Craster. But we're talking like months later only. Speaking, we brought up OSHA earlier. I wonder if he knew OSHA or any of them that in that group. I mean, it was it, OSHA's group was Rangers and wildlings so it was <laughs> yeah that was uh, a mixed bag there so he could have known any of them and i also wonder if he was ever a raider himself i'm going to guess no because of how much he seems to distrust other men and you need to like you're in a team like a squad going over the wall and fighting together and doing like it doesn't seem like he works well with others well he works well with others <laughs> it doesn't work well ah. with lowercase <laughs> others <laughs> Ayo. Uh, the puns keep coming because I call Craster's keep Crasterly Rock. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Because at some point he left White Tree, maybe as a teenager, maybe he was a mama's boy and lived with her for a long time. I don't know. I kind of feel like he was a loner <laughs> from an early age, though. Just no one liked him, not even his mother. You know, <laughs> this guy's just so. Anyway, he did some, maybe he did some other things before building his place, or maybe he took the spot from someone else maybe he found it that way and and added to it no idea why he chose that spot but interestingly it's not near a werewood there's no werewood near his keep which i think is notable he's like i do not want to live near a werewood after where i grew up like that i'm done living near a big creepy werewood (laughs) not doing that i am curious how he built it but it's not exactly impressive it's called a keep by courtesy it is really just john describes it as a midden heap with a roof and a fire pit so and Nina points out, like, he used slave labor. Like, he made his his wives work on this place, most certainly, and, and girls uh, as well. So, yeah, it, it's the show makes it look like more of a structure than it is. It's don't don't have that in your mind when you're picturing it. It's hard not to because it's like the only image you might have. <laughs> but it, it, that that building is larger and more like taller. And yeah, it's more of a real structure. This is not. <laughs> You could, you know, over 10 plus years, 20 or however long he's been there, a couple good summers, you know, you could, you could improve, you could grow a place. I still don't know necessarily if it's in the book meant to be as well built as it was in the show, but I, I can give it credit. Like, especially because John too would particularly downplay it. What a keep is in his mind yeah. is so different. Like other wildlings might be impressed with this <laughs> castle that Craster has, you know? <laughs> So it doesn't have any defenses, no wall, no towers. It has a ditch, like a dike, basically. So like a, a slow, like a little miniature barrier that might slow people down briefly, but a not moat? much. <laughs> it is a castle. It has a moat. Yeah. He could fill it in with water. Yeah. <laughs> but it would just freeze. <laughs> it would be an ice moat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why would an old man with a household of 19 women and girls, he's enslaved, not feel the need to build defenses? Isn't that weird? Like, this is a culture that approves of stealing women. It's like, yes, it's perfectly okay to sneak into someone's house, grab a person, and run away with them. If you can hold on to them, then you earned it. 
So what's the deal here? Like, are people that afraid of Craster? Are they that creeped out by him? Yeah, maybe. Because <laughs> I don't know what else. And I'm like, the others aren't like defending his territory for him because he's sacrificed. It doesn't work like that. We're not going that far with, with this relationship. There's no evidence of that. He says the old gods, the cold gods won't come for him. The gods won't come for him because he's a godly man. He doesn't say anything about, he never says why the other free folk leave him alone. But things that Egret says kind of say it all. Like, yeah, we could go steal a woman from him, but they don't want to. <laughs> they don't like, it's like, Ugh, what's been done to her? Like, that's Craster's child as well. They don't want someone of his bloodline. They don't, yeah, like if his blood is black and he bears a heavy curse. Like, yeah, that's just a... It's just a no-no from a social taboo point. Like, this guy's a kinslayer and a... Yeah, you don't want to... Don't mix with that. So, interesting. Windowless hall, deer hide flaps on the door, bear and ram skulls on the gate, sod roof. Not a wooden roof, not a stone roof, it's sod. Room for 30 to 50, though, uh, so it is, it's got a decent size to it. There's a cellar and a sleeping loft. Uh, a big fire pit, not just a fire pit, but a big one. They, and that's the, that's the difference between life and death for some ranging parties, they say. This big fire pit because it's got a roof over it. 50 to 70 years ago, before Craster was there, I don't know, would they have died? <laughs> I guess maybe. <laughs> like I said, with Blood Raven's party, maybe. <laughs> yeah, did they not range as far in the past? What did they do before Craster? It was, was tougher there? in my day. Ranging has gotten easy. It's soft on you, rangers of these <laughs> days. You got it easy. <laughs> so on the on the idea that he's a quote friend to the watch there's someone else that doesn't like this arrangement so much another younger man who's got a more amiable humorous take than Jon Snow Dolores Ed says do you know the difference between a wildling who's a friend to the watch and one who's not asked the dour squire our enemies leave our bodies for the crows and the wolves our friends bury us in secret graves oh come on now Ed, that's not fair they know better than to leave a body unburned <laughs> they would burn the body <laughs> but yeah it's yeah a true friend burns your body when you die <laughs> <laughs> a smart friend burns yeah, your a body smart, friend. <laughs> smart enemy burns your body yeah you just die. a yeah. smart human beyond the wall <laughs> see a body burn it you know like you know how there's that that thing about how apparently rhinos will stamp out a fire in the savannah when they see it because oh. Hmm. I didn't yeah, know that. certain animals will, will will actually stamp out fires because they. I can... think we should replace our fire department with rhino departments. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah. These guys are the. They opposite. might stamp out some things that aren't fires. Also. Well, then we'll have a we'll have a, like a rhino department for the rhinos. It'll be confusing because there's the rhino fire department and the the rhino department <laughs> that's to deal with rhino emergencies. <laughs> We're, yeah. Anyways. Don't say rhino. Say ry yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that'll be part of the rhino I prefer campaign. Pumpernickel. Pumpernickel, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whole wheat no. <laughs> Craster says Waymar Royce refused to sleep under his roof, as we've said. John, of course, has that same matter. I good for Waymar. I mean, you know, like that kid was a little too much uh vigor and a lot enough listening. But he again, this not definitely not a craven, this one, right? <laughs> Uh, I had a good death, a, a stupid death, maybe, but a good one, you know, uh, brave, etc. Uh, so John and John feels shame at leaving Gilly behind. I don't know. I wonder if Waymar, Waymar might not have that. Like to him, that might be they might be beneath him. He was kind of a snooty guy, but I don't know. I, we don't know that much about him. We don't know what he thought. He might have seen that as an abomination that should be. I mean, Waymar's. Don't forget, Waymar's house is the Royces, and they they they've got a relationship with the old gods, unlike a lot of Southerners. So he might take some of this even more unkindly not that a southerner wouldn't be uh, deeply offended by all this but uh, waymar might have been even a touch higher and he was also a little touchy himself so <laughs> i can see that maybe he didn't like it and didn't want to be part of it but knew he couldn't ruffle feathers so much by trying to do something about it you know or maybe he wanted to one day but knew he was too young and needed to make his play after he, whatever, whatever but another thought i've had about this with both Waymar and maybe John, maybe it's a little bit of privilege. Hmm. Like they have eaten well. John got a couple good meals from Craster and then decided, I don't want to eat his food. No, it's no, he, did, he, he didn't actually the... eat his food. Oh, he didn't get any in the first place. Okay. Makes he refused to, because that's it, what but... Gilly says. You didn't, you didn't eat his food. You can like, he's like, that would be a guest ride violation. He's like, no, you didn't sleep under his mm -hmm. roof. You didn't eat his uh -oh. food. Yeah. He kind of did though. 
He he wasn't offered food by Craster, but remember Ghost killed two rabbits and John uh, ate John yeah. ate one of them with Sam. So but John doesn't think of it that way. He's just like I'm not doing it. It doesn't come to that. But still yeah. There's some wiggle room. But one way or the other, John is the steward. Yes. He's getting fed better than the other Night's Watch. Yes. He's got a better cloak and a better sword and better boots. He's not suffering as much in the cold and rain as these other soldiers who are closer to starving than Same he is. Same as Waymar Royce, Same who thing had really with, nice. Exactly, mm-hmm. right. It's a little easier when you're not on a brink of starvation, when you've got nice clothes, to be pick and choosy about what meal you get. Now, I would still like to think that I, starving would not be okay <laughs> with Craster. Maybe I would accept the food so I don't die, but I would still have it in my mind to do something about it eventually. Maybe I even would forego that if the world was in danger and that was a higher priority. But but there is an element of me that, that wonders about the, the privileged nature of yeah. John and Waymore, maybe Benjamin too. I think that's a strong real world point too. That's why you know people of less means push people of more means to make changes rather than forcing it themselves sometimes because they can't because you can't. Like it's the people with the power that have that have the power to enact that change and they have the privilege to do so without as much cost to their own well being. Uh, maybe maybe I could give uh, Jora or Jior uh, some credit too. Maybe he would like to make this moral stand against Craster, but what am I? I let my men freeze and starve to death. Yeah, like uh, he's in a different position than John. Too, is. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, John can just do that on his own. Like I'm not sitting on his roof, but like some of the others can't. Like no, I, my cloak is too thin. Like I, I, I'm, I'm screwed if I don't have this fire. So you're right. Yeah, it's a really interesting sub discussion here. Uh, Nina frames it similarly here. Uh, she says, I would like to think Waymar deliberately refused to sleep under Craster's roof because he realized the same things John did, that Craster is a terrible person and that he didn't want to be subject to the strictures of guest right from such a horrible host, from someone that he has this huge moral problem with. Uh, Waymar was certainly arrogant and entitled, but he showed honor most of the way through maybe not the way he treated his subordinates but in most things that in that brief time seeing him it's definitely possible though that he's just purely being superior that he's just like no you're some filthy wildling i'm not sleeping beneath your roof you know it's gonna be it could be just that simple so we're ascribing the potential of extra honor where it might just be looking down on him with and it might be a combination of the two it might be like that fuels his his honor is fueled by his contempt. He's like, I'm going to take a hot eye road, but, but also you're gross and I'm looking down on you. <laughs> so, yeah. There's a lot of trouble. To be fair, it's not that high of a road. We all think he's gross and look down <laughs> on him. True, true. <laughs> so there's a, uh, an existing trope that, well, there's a lot of tropes here. A lot of existing tropes, horror tropes. There's the... I mean, George called this forest the haunted forest. I mean, he did decided not to be creative with it at all. I think that's so straightforward that it has to be an intentional choice to make it so, like, that's the most simple name you can come up with. <laughs> it's like, the, it's like a, the most basic fairy tale. Like, you don't have a, you, you, you haven't even described this, the land. It's like, there was a girl who lived in a town. And nearby was that, like, you don't describe the, the anything, but you have this description of, <laughs> of, the one thing, the haunted forest. Okay, <laughs> that's what it's called. This is a fully developed world. <laughs> you still have a place called <laughs> the haunted forest. Uh, George is definitely reversing, inverting a trope, or or really leaning into it. Maybe sometimes it's hard to tell which he's which is which with him because he's so tricksy. But another trope I want to point to. I don't know the name of it. I th- I think I saw Shea trying to look it up over here I while was. I was. While I was like, while she, while we're, while I we're love, talking here, I love TV tropes, so I was trying to find an actual yeah. The trope is you can sleep under my roof, but you can't mess with my daughter slash wife. We've all seen this one before. It's been in a lot of fairy tales, horror stories. Seinfeld did it. Freaking mm-hmm. Seinfeld did it with Newman <laughs> when he's yeah. lost in the, some rural area when they're doing their their recycled cans plan when they're trying to drive all the cans in a mail truck to another state and he gets lost and. Yeah, Kramer kicks him out of the, the truck for weight, <laughs> for to save fuel or whatever. <laughs> so he gets stuck on a farm. Anyway. Yeah, the closest trip I could find was just not under the parents' roof, but that's not quite the right Yeah, one. that's when it's you come it. to visit the parents and they you have to live by. Yeah. You can't sleep together because you're staying with yeah, your exactly, parents. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I this is different. Find it. Yeah, I don't know the name for it. I didn't know how to look it up. I was like, sleep, roof, 
Well, what Life. I did was I, I like, went I to a... episodes of TV on TV tropes where I knew that it happened. Like when uh... Bender uh, can't sleep with the farmer's daughters on the moon. Yeah, in it's Futurama. Futurama too. In Futurama, right. Bender can't like the, there's there's <laughs> Bluebell and the Crushinator, and he ends up like sleeping with the Crushinator. Anyway, the Crushinator is the daughter. That's right. Yeah, so I went to that episode and like didn't have it listed there. And then I tried going to the King of the Hill episode where Bill isn't supposed to sleep with his three cousins. Oh God, there you remember like oh, it's his right. cousins yeah. and he's like he's not supposed to touch the the, the, the beautiful flowers and the New Orleans cousins. <laughs> Anyways, but no, it also doesn't have it listed there. So I don't know. TV so, tropes let me down. So this is a an opportunity, y'all. If you're listening, send us a, your favorite <laughs> example of the you can't sleep under you can sleep under my roof and have my food and all that but don't touch my daughter wife and, yeah. and usually in this story the daughter slash wife is really flirts that, with yeah. them like make like is an enticer like it's is a seducer like makes it a little tougher because or a lot tougher because they're flirting or something yeah it's so, always a temptation so i also tried looking up like temptation ones like i found like things about like the final temptation and stuff like that but so gilly's like an inversion of this trope because there's no lust involved here like the lust the, Sam has to like be led by the nose when sex finally comes into their relationship way later. <laughs> but at this point, there's none of that. There's no like, Ooh, look at her. There's not even a shred of attraction on either side. It's just save me because my child's going to be sacrificed. So it's the temptation is to be honorable in the face of what is called a different sort of dishonor, like an affront to the God. So it's, it's a real like, What's the actual honorable thing to do here? Which is a, a that is a recurring theme that George likes to, to play with is like, what, what is honorable? What isn't? What do you do when two, when honor conflicts? What do you do when people think something, when society says something is honorable, but you just strongly disagree and all the readers do too? Like, there's a lot of examples like this in, in the Song of Ice and Fire. George is really good at that. <clears throat> Another thing I, uh, a side <clears throat> topic I wonder about, which is a segue to the second half of our episode today, in which we will spend a lot of time talking about the others and the sacrifice and, and this stuff. We, we've set this up. Now we're going to dive into it in the second half. But a question I have to lead into that, as I'm saying, is the keep still protected after Craster's death? Do the others associate the sacrifice with that piece of land, that building? Or is it like a deal they have with him? specifically i think it's the inhabitants because i don't know that they recognize him as an individual he might think they do but that's something we'll explore in the second half something for you to think about as we move our way towards that one of many mysteries that we cannot quite get to the bottom of but sure does make us think but first our mid-roll portion of the show the actor who played Craster in Game of Thrones was named Robert Pugh. He was in a lot of recognizable shows that many of you will have heard of or have watched, like The White Queen and Shameless and Nightfall and Doctor Who and Torchwood and Master and Commander. And maybe he's friends with Russell Crowe because he was also in the Robin Hood with Russell Crowe and Kate Blanchett. And those are like two of the only movies he's been in. He's been in a lot of TV shows. So also that Robin Hood also had Mark Addy and, and Max von Sydow, who were, of course, Robert Baratheon and Bloodraven, respectively. Also, had Oscar Isaac in it, which I just... He's not related to Game of Thrones at all, but I'm like, I didn't know he was in that. That's interesting. <laughs> That's a lot of interesting cast members for a movie that sucked, yeah. just so you know. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> I don't recall it. I think I didn't see it, so that might be why I didn't bother to see it, because people said such bad things about it. Indeed. So we're still running our uh, Patreon uh, special. It's only got two weeks left, folks. You got two weeks left to sign up at the $2 level, get all our bonus episodes, get involved in episode voting, behind the scenes stuff every once in a while, get yourself a cool nickname. If you sign up at a higher level, you can get things like access to scripts and other things like that. But if you sign up now for $2, that $2 level is going away in a couple weeks, two weeks, well, right when we start uh, Valor Readers for Fire and Blood. So if you, if you get that lock price locked in, you get to keep it even as the price goes up. So you'll stay at the $2 level even as it goes away. One thing you get is to participate in our uh, Quiplash and Trivia and Gaming sessions, right? That's right. We just had our second one of those on Thursday. That was a lot of fun. We played Quiplash three times, and then we played uh, – oh, shoot. What did we TKO. play? TKO. Oh, TKO, T which is super fun. That's the T-shirt design game where people draw – uh, t-shirt designs and then put slogans and then match them together and create these really funny combinations. It's very, of course, very Game of Thrones themed. 
Yeah, um, there were some funny yeah. drawings for sure. We probably had like 15 people participating. Yeah. Uh, now, you night. don't have to, to, to be a player, you have to be a patron, but you can participate in audience voting, which is a lot of fun still without being a patron. So worth noting, I guess if you go to the Facebook page or the Facebook group, but the Facebook page will be easier to find it. We streamed the last two um, Quiplash sessions. So you should, you, you could go there and just kind of get a sense of the vibe and check it out and all that on the Facebook page. Now the phrase, the cold gods is uttered. I'm pretty sure only by Craster. Maybe one of his wives. No, one of the wives says it. Like, even Gilly says it. But they're the only ones who say it. So only people, only Craster and people who We're are raised associated by with Craster, him. yeah. Yeah, raised by Craster, who, of <laughs> course, would use the same language he does for most things. Calls it that. So let's, we're going to devote most of the second half to, to this part. And we'll start with a key piece of dialogue. Is it Craster who frightens you, Gilly? For the baby, not for me. If it's a girl, that's not so bad. She'll grow a few years and he'll marry her. But Nella says it's to be a boy, and she's had sex and knows these things. He gives the boys to the gods. Come the white cold, he does, and of late, it comes more often. That's why he started giving them sheep, even though he has a taste for mutton. Only now, the sheep's gone too. Next, it will be dogs till... She lowered her eyes and stroked her belly. What gods? John was remembering they had seen no boys in Craster's Keep, nor men either, save Craster himself. The cold gods, she said. The ones in the night. The white shadows. There are so many rabbit holes in that conversation. Let's do some of the smaller ones <laughs> first. Like, it, I hope that's not literal when she says he'll grow, the, the girl will grow a few years, then he'll marry them. Like, a few? Not yeah. even yeah. ten? He yeah. gads. Ugh. And then she says, of late, it comes more often. Now, that we kind of knew already. Yeah, winter is it's getting colder. The, the visits are coming more often. That that really just, yes. we the, the appearance of them to Waymar Royce and at the Fist of the First Men, yes, definitely. Of course, the Fist comes after this, but still, we have that. We know about that. Uh, how long has this been happening? Again, uh, that's something we wondered, like, did his mother sacrifice to the old, like, when did this arrangement happen? How did it come along? Did he decide to do it? He's like, I'm, I know I'll start sacrificing to them. No one, no one does that, but I'll show everybody how it's done. He might've had the idea. He's he is as, as much as he's disgusting. He is an independent thinker. I think it's fair to call him that. He doesn't seem to listen to what anyone else has to say. Doesn't really follow trends he's not really doing things because other people do them he's really just doing his own thing he's got hermit vibes for sure except for that he's got all these women that he's forced to be around him so yeah if, you, if you're an independent thinker you're just like a craster <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry independent thinker quick that's, someone tell me how to think that's not what i meant <laughs> So Nina says it's probably a little of column a, a little column b she doesn't think craster came up with the idea on her on his own this is a practice that has probably existed for a long time. The others have existed for a long time. If you've got a big, powerful being that you don't know what it wants, that's a normal thing to do. Try to offer it things, like get, make offerings to the gods. Like, that happens. Like, that's happened in the real world. People just, they don't know what the gods want, so they give them things they think they want. I mean, it, that's the source of a lot of real world logic, quote unquote, behind sacrifice in the first place. It's like, Give them something that's valuable to us or that we think is valuable to them so they don't destroy us or so that the sun keeps rising or that so that spring comes. It's a very similar, like, basic deity logic of we got to give them something or they'll kill us. Uh, but the idea that it's got to be suns, like, that is where Nina thinks Craster is just making that up because it's it, it's what he wants it, it works for him that way he can keep all these other men away and no one's ever going to challenge him so it's like yeah i'm gonna leave well also also so that he can keep creating more children if he mm, if true. he gave all the women away then he wouldn't be able to make any more babies to sacrifice that's a good so. point yeah let's logistically he needs as many baby makers as he can to pull off this keep the others at bay with as many sons as possible. And as the sun, as the cold gets colder, he needs more sons to do. It. I mean, this is obviously his logic, his quote unquote. But logic. why can't he get more goats instead of more <laughs> know, human women right? and babies? Like, cause it's weird enough. And it seems like that was something that worked 
at least some at some point right yeah. she says that the sheep are all gone now so next it's dogs we have left yeah. like how long did it take for the sheep to go how did he find out that sheep work I there's so say, many things about this that are so weird if we're saying that like the, the young boy like babies are at all turned into others if that's at all the thing that we think is possible right yeah, see, I'm just picturing sheep others now. <laughs> that's where the giant, yeah, that's where the giant ice spiders come from. You know. Yeah, that's where ice spiders. spiders. Yeah, where, where sheep originally. <laughs> um. Yeah, so the idea, like they like it's it's the stories say that they like life. They like young life, especially. So if you're sacrificing young the youth or young animals, and that kind of fits into what has been said for thousands of years. But it's interesting to think that if, how long have they been collecting the sacrifices? Is he putting them out there and just a sheep is out there and just some wolf comes and takes it? And he's like, yep, the cold gods came. I don't think so. <laughs> it's possible. But, but the evidence suggests that no, Gilly and other, some of the other wives have seen the others. They've been able to describe them. So I kind of don't think the whole just some wild animals coming off and he's saying it's the cold god. I don't think that works as a theory because they've been present, like literally present. So, but when did it start? In there also does seem to be a coldness that comes with it too, yes, right? Yes. So every time a wolf comes, it gets extra cold. That, does, that doesn't that really fit. Too. Yeah. Um, and they they feel like it's a certain, that the cold has like a quality to it that they recognize. Kind of like Daiwan has that, he can smell it a certain way. It's like there's something about it that's off. And maybe someone who's more, who's lived beyond the wall other years can, is better at sensing that difference, the differentiating between cold, natural cold and supernatural cold. Someone who's felt a lot of both might know the difference. Or a lot of one might know well, something's different about this cold. Something feels evil about it. I'm going to take this seriously because we know the others are a thing. You know, that kind of thing. Even aside from the supernatural element, there there's a difference in a humid cold and a dry cold. That's true. For example, yeah. right? And often, usually, cold comes in either with wind or as the sun sets. But imagine if it's the same time of day and there's no wind and it suddenly goes from 40 degrees to 20 degrees like that. It, maybe the feel of the cold is the same, but the nature of how quickly it came doesn't, is it natural? You know? Yeah. So, Another thing along this supernatural idea though, I was starting to stew in this earlier. Now I'm coming back to it. Maybe this spot that Craster has, maybe it's, it's, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, it, maybe there's like a rune around it, right? Mm. Like how, how like uh, it seemed like dragons maybe can't pass the wall. Theoretically, White Walkers can't pass the wall. Maybe wildlings can't pass into Craster's Keep. Maybe there's some sort of spell or rune or something. Rangers can. That's why he lets them in. But he's safe from wildlings because there's something about this area that the others can get in well, or can't other get people in. Have maybe been they there. like other free folk have gone there. There's no like it's not okay. Like okay. like the messenger came from Mance. Hmm. He, he, yeah. You know, yeah. He did get his tongue nailed to the door, but he did come. <laughs> there wasn't any sort of like no. barrier. I mean, I could see maybe a yeah. I don't know. That's tough. Let's 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 look at a different piece of evidence here. She says Nella. Nella says it's to be a boy, and she's had six and knows these things. Does that mean she's had six children or six boys? Because damn, six boys and I had to give them all away. Yeah, I figured oh. six children though. Yeah, I, I, guess, th I think but... maybe yeah. So. If he's been doing this a long time and, and, and it's been working a long time, then it means the others have been back sooner than we might have thought. We might have been thinking they've, they, Waymar's encounter with them was they've just returned. But, it, but if Crash has been doing this for a while, he's been sacrificing his sons for like more than a generation, definitely more than a generation. Some of his wives are as, almost as old as he is, or at least in their past their childbearing years and have had children. So like, Possibly as long as like 40 years he's been doing this. Way before the comet, way before. I mean, that's. That's like Summer Hall. That's like when Summer Hall happened 40 years ago. So, not that they're connected events, but I'm just saying that's how long ago it was. So, that the others have been coming, have been back that long or even longer. Like, I don't think that he was the first one to notice. That's, that would be quite a coincidence. Seems like people much farther north would have been the ones uh, on that tip sooner than the people really close to the wall. Like the Fens would have known sooner, you know, like man says the Fens couldn't stand against the others, nor could the Ice River. None, none of these other farther northern people could stand against the others. It sounds like they may have tried. So 
the fact that animal sacrifice works is what you're saying, Sean. It's like, why not just keep giving them animals then? Well, that's that's where we get into Craster has made a deal with the devil. Not just made a deal with the devil, but he's profiting from it. He's create. He's like the the former slave that helps other slaves become enslaved. That helps the masters, or uh, you know, just a, someone who turns against their own people. You know, someone who's the conduit for the worst things. Nina says Craster's probably just guessing what the others want. He selfishly, doesn't want to surrender any women because, like Sean said, he wants to keep enslaving them and raping them and having more children. The others, so far as we know, can't talk to people. They have that language, scroth, but there's no reason to think Craster speaks scroth or that they can speak to him. So there's no, like, hammering out an arrangement here, <laughs> right? He's, they're like, they didn't leave a grocery list of, yes, boys first, sheep second, do-, like, they, you know, like, he's like, well, that's what they... I, could, I, I was actually... Uh, could he have dreams, maybe? That playing a scenario out in my mind. Where they, maybe they indicate, maybe he brings them to sheep and they're like, no, <laughs> they nod their heads, shake their heads and want two sheep. Oh. And it's like, Ugh. So it goes back and get another. And then so now you know, right, maybe the others keep raising the stakes. Mm. Maybe maybe he brings two sheep and now they shake their head and he's, you know, what, three? And they're like, shake their heads, still no. Like, what do you want? And they point at a child, you know. He's like, oh, geez. I, I can see how it might be communicated yeah. that they want something beyond what he's been giving. I can see that, too. I think I could see that, too. And especially... Because... That would be a very scary, menacing scene to portray, too. Yeah, you know? because, like, and you can see why the others would want, would like the arrangement. They're like, okay, here's a guy just willing to give us fresh meat. You know, we, you know, sometimes it's a baby. <laughs> like, we, we'll take the sheep and the dogs, but, hey, sometimes it's a baby. The problem with that is still, why don't the others just go take it? How can he stop them? Why does he need to make a sacrifice? Why don't they just walk in and take well, a sheep Because then there won't leave? be, well, because then it's not, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point, I guess. Yeah. Maybe there's some Well, then they don't know. Well, then how does he know that that's who it's taking them? How does he know to make more well, Why does he need to how know? He, I'm just saying, why are the others doing it? Because he's like willing. This? He's leaned into it. He's profiting from this arrangement. So he wants to give them what they want. So if they want sons, he's going to give them to them. But if they take sons... Without, like, they are taking, they're forcing it. He doesn't understand how or why it's happening. Yeah, so like, if it's just like, hey, another sheep vanished, like, how does he know who took it? He doesn't know to, like, worship them. Like, they, yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it's possible. It doesn't work, seem to fit quite as well. So, yeah, I think Craster is as bad as we think. This isn't some, like, he has no choice here. He, his sacrifices do seem to actually keep the others away. It does work, as far as we can tell. That doesn't mean it's good. That doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, obviously. He's made a deal with the devil in a way that maximizes the return for himself. It's worse than slavery because it's, he's giving away his own kin. It's kin slaying and slavery or just sacrifice. It's either slavery or sacrifice because he doesn't know what's being done with those children. They're probably just being killed. Some people think they're being turned into others. I'm not so sure about that. Like, think about the age problem, although that might be resolved by the length of time difference that we may have spoken to here. Maybe this has been going on a lot longer than we thought. Gilly and the other wives think that they are the sons. They think the sons are new others. But Crash Reminder just told them that as a way to, like, get them to buy into this whole, like, get them to not scream and cry and, and try to kill him for giving away their sons. Like, if they think it's, oh, it's the, I'm not the one doing it. It's the others that demand the sons. If he's convinced them all that this is true, then they'll go along with it. Because, like, what choice do they have? They'll die otherwise. But if not, they might kill him. They might, like, that might be the thing that finally pushes them. Like, no, you're not taking my son. I mean, this is moving Gilly to run away. That's how, that's how, like, she's not as concerned for herself. She wants her son to survive. And that, uh, Craster knows that that's probably the thing that, understandably, a woman or a man, too, would care most about is their children. So he's found a way to blame it on a higher authority figure, authority figure when really it's just something that he's doing because it works for him, because he keeps the men away from him. He doesn't have anyone to compete with him for the rule of his keep. No young boy to stand up for their mother saying, I don't like how you're treating my mother. I'm going to fight you. And that boy might be able to kill Craster if he's strong and tough and Craster's getting old. And yeah, Craster doesn't want any competition. Doesn't have to be tough and strong if you do it in his sleep. True. Which, uh, Absolutely I true. Remember, yeah. I seem to remember there being a couple of the Night's Watch wondering why that hasn't happened. Gior right? Mormont says that exact thing. Ask, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was it? Answered prayer. Answered prayer. I would name that axe answered prayer. In fact, we have that quote later mm-hmm. in the episode. So he's basically arranged this sacrifice scenario to come out ahead for himself. He's like, yep, I'm getting rid of my sons that I didn't want anyway. 
getting protection, getting to do all the getting all this labor from these women and getting all the sex I want and making them do all my work. And I'm just sitting here drinking and hunting and whatever else he does. And that's the life he wants to live. It's, it's bad. It's real bad. And it's quite a moral conundrum for the night's watch. So his attitude towards bastardy comes out a few times. This is sort of tied into it all. When he meets John, he opines that a man should marry a woman before sleeping with her. Yeah, even if they're five, Craster, even if they're your daughter. I mean, come on. Like, yes, yeah, so we'll talk about the most ab- absurd moral high ground, attempted moral high ground. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, Craster himself is the same as John. You know, he was born, uh, he's a bastard as well. Nina calls this a obviously completely ridiculous assertion <laughs> on Craster's part. What agency do the women have in this scenario? Like, they can't say no to becoming his wives. They... He abuses them, too. I mean, not just beyond the raping. He's abusing them in other ways. And other free folk hate him, and they hate the Night's Watch. So they hate, like, they hate both sides of him. They hate the fact that he's part crow, and they hate the fact that he does all these other things, breaks all these taboos, and and they kind of hate that he's protected from the others because of how he does that. And the Night's Watch will attack without his protection. So they are also, some of them are also kind of like, what do we do about this? How can any of them have a real choice in the matter, though? Like his, his wives, they just don't. So there's, it's, it's beyond hypocrisy. And I want, uh, Nina wonders if this is a way that he grew, if he grew up believing this as a way to justify his existence. If he believed that his Night's Watch father had rejected him, then he might have decided that the Night's Watch prohibition on marriage and children was itself the evil. That's the bad part. He's like, well, this is the problem. Like, you can't marry. Like, the Night's Watch has these rules against marriage. And that was... That affected his his life path so much as a child because he was never, never going to have a father. And because of this weird law that they have, from his perspective, it's weird. That's why. So that's why he's so adamant about marriage because it's, it's kind of the opposite of, of what he was born into. It's also a form of generational trauma. Craster was abandoned by his own father before he even knew him, and that's the fate of his sons as well, except for the they're not just abandoned. They're killed or converted into undead demon things. Or actually not undead. George says the others are not dead. So not they're not undead. They are some sort of spiritual, evil, demonic being or something, but they're not undead. They just make undead. <laughs> uh here's another telling line. Real quick. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I wanted to add, I, I just thinking about the idea of why the women don't kill him. It still doesn't take away from what he's doing, being evil and disgusting and everything else. But maybe they know he's right. Maybe they know if they kill him that the others will come and kill all of them, too. Well, I don't or think they, they would they, know. I don't think they could possibly know that. They might fear it, though. Know. He may have told right, them. Right, right. There's might zero fear, chance yeah. they know that for a fact. Well, I mean, like, nobody it, does. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. Like, well, what is belief? Like, if they feel like they yeah. feel strongly. They like, might they, believe it enough. They, they, it enough. they see him yes. put the babies yes. out. They see this monster come take the baby. They think, well, if we don't put the baby out, the monster's going to get us. And we need a man to make babies. He's the only man. Like, uh, you know, maybe they mm. feel stuck. That's a good point. And it's like even, 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 even one. If, never mind the gaslighting that they might face and the threat of violence and everything else. And but, like, but what if yeah. also their supernatural occurrence is making them afraid beyond? Yeah, it's that. like it's okay. only it's not like all the women have to think like that. It's like a couple of the women, especially like the women who've been there a long time, who are like in charge. If you the know, older like, women are bought take, in, they're going to help Craster s- spread these lies to the younger women, and they're just all going to believe it. It's also free folk ethos. Okay, let's look at this next line because it kind of fits in here. Quote. This is our place. Craster keeps us safe. Better to die free than live a slave. Of course, they are you're slaves. slaves. Yeah, you're, they you're are. A slave. They just don't realize it. They think this is. They don't realize they're in. They've been lived in this so long. They can't look at it from the outside and say, "Okay, no, you are a slave." They think that the people in the Seven Kingdoms live as slaves, but they're more. Most of them are more free than than Craster's wives. They don't have the choices that even a, a common-born woman in the North would have. Like they have that. That is not a great life either. But those folk have more freedom than these, uh, especially because like maybe it's an interesting kind of back and forth. Like as a woman, you're not going to get drafted into the army. You might get drafted into service for the army, though. So it's maybe maybe that's not much of a differentiator after all. You might get drafted into service for a husband. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> true. Like a similar scenario like this where it's just you are, quote unquote, like even free, a high woman, right? You're, yeah. 
Yeah. Even the hybrid woman doesn't necessarily get to marry the man she loves. She just Very gets true. stuck with whoever she's told. Yeah, it's know. a real crapshoot there. And what about being a slave when you're dead, like a white? That's a kind of a recurring, like, meta consideration we have. Like, do they remember who they were? Do they have, like, a concept of what's going on? Do they feel controlled? Either way, it's an undead army of, of dead slaves. You can look at it that way for sure. Nina also says, this quote is such a perfect encapsulation of Crasher as a character for several reasons. First of all, the women in Crasher keep our slaves, as we've said. Crasher may not use that term, and he may not, he doesn't literally keep them enslaved, but they're just as stuck. They can't go anywhere, and it's they're they're mentally enslaved too because they believe that this is better. Like they've been tricked into thinking this is a, this is the way it is. Now, in some way, some of the aspects are true. Like it is tough to live beyond the wall, and having protection is valuable. But the stuff they've been told about the uh, the cold gods is, is the heart of where a lot of these lies are. As is the truth of what's on the other side of the wall and how people live over there. But these are things Crasher can lie about, knowing that there's almost no way anyone can set them straight. Who's going to tell them what life on the other side of the wall is actually like? Will they even believe it? Because it's being told to them by Night's Watch, who Craster has surely embedded them with a distrust of the Night's Watch, like most free folk have. So it's not exactly a hard sell. And the rest, yeah, just starts from birth. You know, you, you teach someone from youth to believe these things they're probably going to believe them it's hard to break out of what you've been taught as a as a child especially when there's no alternative viewpoints around to even entertain in the first place so this safety is not really safety it's like the the safety of a of a cult you know where they demands everything of you and only prevents you from harm but it, it expects everything else from you it's kind of like the, the mary maz thing once over again like what is life when everything you know and love is gone like life is you may still be alive you have your safety but everything that made your life worth living is gone and, and worse than that you have all these painful memories and trauma of what you used to have or what used to be good and, and that's gone forever so yeah like this all comes back to that i think by the way, I didn't mention it this time. Speaking of Danny and these other things, uh, that moment of finding the bones in the white trees, Ash, it's very similar to those are no those are no sheep's bones. Remember the same thing when when that woman brings that man brings the burn, burn bones of her his daughter yeah. that was killed by uh, I almost said Balerian Drogon. Uh, the, the embarrassed and says those are no sheep's bones. It's, <laughs> it's like both times it's like no, that's a child. Yeah, ooh, hmm. different different reasoning, but. Similar vibe, different, yeah, different uh, setup. And pl not to mention the others themselves kind of make it in a sense that no, if they're active, no one beyond the wall can truly be free. If they're coming in the night and either attacking you or demanding sacrifice or it's no different than like living under a mafia boss. Like your village is taken over by the mafia and they demand and expect all these things. You have your protection, <laughs> but like at any, <laughs> at any moment they can on their whim, they can come in and take things from you and you have absolutely nothing you can do about it. I mean, the same is true for any authority uh, to some extent, but that's why we in the real world hope that our authorities have checks and balances put on them. <laughs> you know, they don't always, but that's why we do. That's why we want that. And there's no check and balance against Craster's lies and enslavement of these. And that's the problem with living free is there's no like structure to you make certain sacrifices in liberty yeah. for the sake of security, yes. right? And that's hopefully what a good government is balancing properly. But this is a sacrifice in liberty for not security. Yeah. You're still not secure if your children have to be sacrificed, right? Yeah, the basic things we say, right? The life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do they have any? They have life, but they don't have liberty or the pursuit of happiness. They have one of those things. Yeah. Especially as a mother, like having your son, knowing like, okay, 50-50, this child that I'm pregnant with is going to be sacrificed. And if they believe- and what's the other 50? Yeah. By the way. <laughs> enslaved and raped, yes. The other, yeah. <laughs> and married, quote unquote married, yeah. So it's a real mockery of, of good institutions, <laughs> the way Craster sort of spins them and has the- I, enough isolation from society for these lies to work. Like if you were- if there was a town square that these women were visiting every day, they would hear these other ideas and hear how other women were treated. And they'd be like, actually, the world isn't the way Craster says, because which is why Craster's always like no one even talks to them. 
He doesn't even let the, he doesn't want people. He's like, they can't mess with, he can't, they can't chase them, but he really he doesn't want them to have any contact at all. He doesn't want them to even speak. He doesn't want these, his lies undone. He doesn't want alternative viewpoints being put into their minds. None of that. Knowledge is power. Knowledge right? is power. And his, his power over them re- relies on their lack of knowledge. Yeah. Without that, it falls apart. Like even the idea of like being a slave, they probably don't know what that means. They don't understand. It's it's like telling a child that you're going to burn in hell if you commit a sin. Like, what is hell? Like they might know what burn means, but they just don't. It's just a bad thing. Yeah. You just know it's a bad thing that you're supposed to avoid. So I won't commit a sin. Okay, what are the sins? Whatever you're told is a sin. You, you just see what I'm saying? They're totally pretty arbitrary. Yeah. And so the behavior that he wants, yeah. you know. In a way, he's kind of like Melisandre, or even more like Euron, someone who exaggerates and or distorts what they know about the supernatural for mysterious ends, shall we say. In Euron's case, it's really a lot very, uh, even more similar, because Melisandre's not doing it for her own ends specifically, not that she thinks. But she is under a belief system, and she is acting under, based on gods she believes are harsh and demanding and must be appeased or the world ends or whatever so it's similar kind of thing except she actually uh wants to save the world and things like that obviously there but you can see the similarities yeah obviously i'm not saying craster is just like melisandre but you're on there's a lot more of a parallel because you're on is specifically trying to mislead people about the supernatural for just personal gain uh to advance his own ends he's obviously is a lot more ambitious than craster but he's also like misrepresenting the gods your very much does this and uh as creepy attitudes towards women he's a raper and a slaver and doesn't really have morals and yeah so yeah you're and craster have a lot in common even melisandre like sometimes she's deceitful but when she's deceitful she like you know starts a flyer a fire with powder and it's not really magic when craster's deceitful he murders a baby yeah right like <laughs> i mean to be fair melisandre wanted to burn babies too she wanted to burn gendry but- and <laughs> and, but again, even when she wanted to do that, she genuinely believes, yeah. however crazy it may seem, but she thinks that she's saving That's the true. realm yeah. or saving the soldiers or saving the world. Even she has, she's not trying to like preserve her incestuous life, right? Yeah. She's doing something she believes for the greater good. She's making sacrifices too, even though the sacrifices she demands might be dishonest, might be misleading. She, she's not. She's kind of putting her money where her mouth is, and she's <laughs> demanding them from. People who aren't gaslit. Yeah. She, Stannis isn't tricked into knowing what a child is or something. He understands <laughs> yeah. what's at stake yeah. and what's being asked now, of he, him, She has right? misled him on some things. Don't. But you're right. But she, he right. has way more information. Like, yeah, he's not n- half as naive as Craster's wives because he hasn't lived in a hut beyond the wall all his life with no other people around. Like, yeah. It's not a judgment on the wives. Yeah, no, of course ignorant. not. It's a judgment on Craster to make them ignorant. He is, yeah, he's forced this ignorance on them. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to have a, get a great education beyond the wall anyway. But yeah, but he's made it even worse. Uh, so here's an interesting point. One of Craster's wives, here's the story. They're talking about the whites at Castle Black, Othor and Jafer Flowers rising in the night and the you know Lord Commander's quarters getting burned and John getting Longclaw as his reward. That's interesting. They've seen the others, as far as we know, but she seems to she reacts very strongly to hearing about the whites. So she seem it's quite possible she's seen the others, but not the whites, which is hmm. that's interesting. So uh, alternately, Nina says maybe she's not so much shocked at the idea the whites exist as worried about the implications of that report. Like, wait, you're telling me the others are acting operating raising the dead on the other side of the wall infiltrating the lord commander's tower at the night's watch you're telling me they've done that that's only going to make her more scared it was like okay yeah craster we got to yeah more sacrifice <laughs> like crap like that's that is alarming you hear that the, the the organization devoted to fighting the others their commander's tower was assaulted by the others like the wall like isn't it supposed to keep them out like, what went wrong? What does that even mean? Oh, crap. Like, that's bad. It's verification. <laughs> like, the little bit yeah. of knowledge that Craster has given them that is true, that's the scariest thing, they now have verification for. Yeah. Right? And so it makes them believe everything else he says. It makes the thing that, that he, they're supposed to be scared of, they really are scared of it. And Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. Like, the logic, they, they follow the logical train here. They're like, okay, so the others are already attacking Castle Black. 
but they continuously they still have left Craster's Keep alone. That's yeah, you like you said, that's gonna make them think Craster's telling the truth. Like, yep, or at least he's doing the the something that works to keep the others at bay or away because they bypassed Craster's Keep for some from a much tougher southerly target. You know? So oof. John is skeptical at first that they've seen the others because Craster says he hasn't seen them, claims to have not seen them, which, as we've said before, is probably a lie. And here's the result of that dialogue when John quizzes Gilly. Quote. What color are their eyes? He asked her. Blue, as bright as blue stars and as cold. She has seen them, he thought. Craster lied. Very, very much wonder in what context she saw them. Did she witness them collect a sacrifice? Did she see the, like the pointing thing that Sean talked about? If anything remotely like that happened, some rudimentary attempt at communication, were they on foot? Were they riding horses, ice spiders, some other animal? Were they, I mean, if Gilly had seen them, Gilly's like the one of the youngest, if not the youngest of the wives. So that means the others have too. The others have seen the others too. Yeah, see, the, the show change the name others because it gets a little confusing in discussion <laughs> when you're reading it it's not confusing at all because it's always capitalized but i kind of see <laughs> why they did that when, when, every time we talk about it it's like yeah i get it i get it <laughs> i still think it's possible that gilly hasn't seen them that she was just told that their yeah, eyes are blue absolutely Good but call. still someone else had to see them to know that their eyes are blue yeah. so mm -hmm. so i mean that is the rumor about them but but john has seen them uh, or seen the the whites he hasn't seen the others uh well he hadn't at that point this is before the fist of the first man. Uh, of course, yeah. <laughs> All that works out differently. So it seems, yeah, so I agree with you. It's absolutely possible that she's just repeating what she's been told, and it happens to be correct. So it, 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 the story passes muster. Another interesting thing to remember, though, they don't leave footprints. So it's not like that, that was them. Like he could, It's not like Crasher can point to footprints and say that was them that came and, and lie, although he could just pretend and say that was them and it was just some other footprints. But if they've seen them face to face, then you don't need to tell any stories. It's like, well, there you go. They've seen them. That's that's all the scaring I need to do. Now I just take that fear and, and manipulate it for my own ends. Look, he might even make sure they see him, right? Like to if, make sure if he wants to keep. And it, yeah, yeah. And, and again, it adds to why they don't move against him. He he needs to make them believe that this is for some. I'm the only thing standing know, between you and them. Yeah, yeah. that's it's. Fear works, man. It really does work. And then let's remind ourselves of what they look like. Here's another time where you really got to put the show out of your mind. If you don't take him, they No, will. no, no, not that. Sorry, oh. that's not the quote. Oh. Where? This is a quote for me. I'm reading this oh, It's bad, not. It's bad. not italicized. Stra this is what George said about them. Strange, <laughs> beautiful, think, oh, the, the she made of ice, something like that, a different sort of life, inhuman, elegant, dangerous. To be fair, George has struggled to describe them. When he's described them to artists, we've, we've read the takes of artists who have described the others in detail. And a lot of them are like, George is good at describing what they aren't, but he's mm -hmm. not as good at telling <laughs> what they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been a real struggle for authors. Like a lot of the authors, rend I mean, artist renditions of them. I'm like, they look awesome, but I'm like, I'm not sure that's right. Like, I don't know that they have hair and they're very often portrayed as having hair. I'm not sure that they do. But they're just made, they're kind of human-like, so, but inhuman, but human-like. I, like, so. I think I've seen designs that make them, like, their hair is kind of, like, white flame. You know what I yeah. mean? Have you seen that, like, art like that? Or, like, it looks kind of like a human would see it as hair, but it's not hair. It's absolutely not actually hair. It just, like, has the, like, appearance almost of hair, but it is a different, so, I don't know. Yeah. I've seen things like that. I can lot. see that. That's and, and that's why different artist interpretations, like, they just got to do something. They got to think of something cool and be imaginative with it. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I like that. I like that. But but they're all kind of guessing, you know. <laughs> George is going to have to narrow it down a little more when when they're, they're on screen a little more, you know, more prominent people. I tried to Google seed hay. I don't know if I'm saying that word right, she, but it's, it's like... She. She. Oh, I even know that. I, yeah. I learned that's like an Irish phonetic rule. Irish, and, Scottish. Uh, S followed yeah. by a uh, vowel is S H. But but anyway, yeah, that in itself is just this huge diversity. It's hard to really get anything from that. Yeah, it's it's, it's a sort of like an elf. Legendary. But think of how many different ways elves have been presented. You know, yeah. so. the the fae is a huge category. All the different very fairy like yeah. beings and the different versions of them. Yeah, there's so many different versions of it. You're right. So. Like some of them are like tall and big and broad shoulder, barrel chest and muscular with like goat legs. And some of them are like skinny and tiny little fairies on a flower. Like that's the range, you know, like it's, yeah, it's hard to really get too giant, much from that. Giant uh, range. You're right. And, but a lot of versions of she steal children. 
So that is part of where George is coming yeah. from with that, I think. That's that's the a, lore at least, but not the look. Yeah. <laughs> not yes, the lore, but not the look. Absolutely. Nina says the others are certainly taking a good amount of inspiration from tropes of evil fairies. Evil fairies, not just good ones, right? More so. They are inherently inhuman and they can't be effectively negotiated with by humans or live on even terms with humans. You can leave out offerings for fairies, you can avoid fairy places, you can make all the right defenses you want, but sometimes evil fairies just mess with you because that's what they do. <laughs> And these are more powerful than the regular evil fairies. These are more godlike, even though they're not gods, I don't think. Craster calls them that because it's semantic, something that's that much more powerful than you. Like, are we gods to ants? Eh, whatever, you know. <laughs> it is a way that he can get away with quote unquote lying. Yes, that's true. I, uh, Exaggerating their power I, makes him seem more important. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or using a different word, oh, right? Just using yeah. a different word. Okay. And and he really believes it or gets the people around him to believe it. But it's really a different thing. He's just using a, a different word than what most people think. I, I, that crossed my mind, too, with uh, Benjen Stark, that he might have seen a white version of Benjen. Mm, but he, he can honestly say, no, I didn't see him because that's not really Benjen. That's a white. But that would have been good information for the White Knight's Watch. But it's not information they want to hear or whatever. Maybe the others don't want him to tell or something, but it's a way he might have seen him be dead, white or otherwise. Yeah. Might have seen his dead body. Uh, no, that's not him anymore. So, <laughs> no, I haven't seen him in three years. <laughs> yeah, like going back to your, your point about not checking in with Crasters, there another, I just, I did think of another reason. Maybe they got a lead on where he might, where to, where to check before they got to Crasters and followed that lead, which took them a different direction. Still, I don't believe that he hasn't seen <laughs> hasn't seen Benjamin in three years. That's just Benjamin yeah, would have passed that, that angle, way many times. Yeah. Even your angle, which supports my proposition, I can counter that too. When they double check with Craster, they still would check you know, once they, they once, a random lead yeah. because once that that led to a dead end, they would be like, okay, well that didn't pay off. Mm -hmm. We gotta, yeah. <laughs> or or even if it was a correct, even if they got a lead from somewhere else of where Mance was, and it was true and correct. It's a long freaking way away. How long are they going to travel there without some verification? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's a literally a life risking journey. Maybe we get Crasher to back it up, you know? So jumping far ahead, it's just something I think about as, as like a, a later topic or something that hopefully will happen. Sam needs to write down what he's seen. He's at the Citadel. He needs to put that stuff down for posterity. But Gilly, like they don't know what a treasure they have with Gilly there <laughs> in old town. She has seen some stuff. More than Sam has, for sure. Everything Sam has seen, she has seen. Because she was there with him when they f fought Small Paul and the Ravens were there and Cold Hands came. Like, she was there for all that. And she was there at Craster's her whole life before that for whatever else was, whatever else went down. She could spill some tea, y'all. And that, that d belongs in the history book. So I definitely hope that happens. Something like that. But that's, uh, that's dreaming ahead. Let's stick with more in the, uh, in the present. Another piece of evidence comes from the last line in the chapter where the mutiny occurs. So that's a storm of swords. Here's Gilly talking to Sam. If you don't take him, they will. They, said Sam, and the raven cocked its blood. Sorry, I'm going to start again. They, said Sam, and the raven cocked its black head and echoed, They, they, they. <laughs> <laughs> the boy's brothers, said the old woman on the left, Craster's sons. The white colds rising out there, Crow. I can feel it in my bones. These poor old bones don't lie. They'll be here soon, the sons. That's what I was saying. Like, they know how to tell the difference between the cult types of cold. And they kind of have a sense of these, how often it's like, it's been a while since they've come. It's about time they show up again and demand another sacrifice. Like, they have a sense of this frequency. And, yeah. Uh... The daughters became Craster's other wives, and according to her, they become the others themselves, the, the sons. So now here's a there's a perception in the in the fandom. This is another thing that the show has done that's that's thrown things off a little bit. Every other appeared to be male in the show. There is no evidence that's the case in the books. None whatsoever. Except maybe this helps fuel that belief. This thing that Crasher's giving his sons away. But I personally don't think the others are turning these children into other are, are turning his sons into new others. It's absolutely possible. I think there's a decent chance of it. But I think it's just a regular old death. They're sac they like young life. They consume it somehow. And that's it. Yeah, I mean, I got, yeah, it makes you wonder, like, how many would there be? Like, there's a lot of logistical questions about the act of turning a baby into 
an adult other and like can they do that i mean they had to make new others somehow and i don't know if they know how to make other. maybe the children made new others it doesn't well, I mean, mean the others can reproduce themselves. do they have to know how to make new others still like could there have been an x number like, let's say there were 200 others created way back when and now they're down to 20 and they're not making new others like do we like, i don't know that we think they have to know how to make new others yeah, i they think they've they lost could, the way to procreate yeah i think yeah. they could just have i mean they could have been created and never been able to procreate and yeah. this is just they're all they're on their last legs their last the last few even I think that's possible. It's entirely possible. Well, they might be. It's an interesting thing. Maybe they're searching for ways to procreate. Yeah. Maybe they don't yeah. know how. And they're, try- they're trying to re-unearth lost lore on how to re- propagate their species. Yeah. That would be very interesting. Having just returned from wherever after so long, they don't know what their compadres knew thousands of years ago. Maybe Crasser's a genius and he's saving the world. <laughs> I had thought a second ago, well, listen, when, he, when you said a second ago that there's no real evidence that there are only male others, that... There's no evidence that they're even male, right? Yeah, there's, there's, there's the, no they reason they might have... be genderless. Uh, yeah, they might be hundred percent. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so, given that, if they're researching how to procreate, and Craster only gives them male, so they'll never figure out how it works. <laughs> 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 if I give them, you want one a baby? Of these, Here's a baby. Make, See yeah. if you can make new. No I'm yeah, I'm misleading them, y'all. I'm I'm the good guy here. I totally <laughs> tricked them into. No, it's interesting. You're right. I, I have that in the notes here too. Like, there's no reason to think they have any. Gen- like, if you're designing. If you're building a robot for the purpose of stacking boxes, you don't assign it a gender. Uh, like, you it's not, it it's so not relevant it has, to its existence. Yeah, you don't make it so that it can procreate and have babies either. Yeah, so the same thing with the others. Like, why would they even have gender? I mean, you, I'm not saying they don't because there's a, you might because they, be they might be converted people. They might be ex-humans. So they would maybe they maintain might, the gender that they had when they were transformed. They might not but have gender not. either, but they might still have what is effectively a gender identity for other things too. Like they might take on certain roles in their cultures yeah. and there's a split between them. And it's like not what a human male, female uh, sex difference would be, but they could still have like, these others are the warrior class and these others are the, you know, the ones we saw the, kill the ones that are like the rangers of the w- others. Yeah, and like, that and could whole... be effectively split on like culturally yeah. in other ways. It's, it, it doesn't have to just be the same human dichotomy. Agree. Totally agree. There's no reason to assume human dichotomies here. The show, and like I said, the show really threw it off because they portrayed every child of the forest as female and every other as male, which is like, it's possible George told them they were all male, but there's no, but I really doubt that because there's no way he told them that all the children of the forest were female because that's explicitly not true. We've seen male children of the forest. So that, that part's not true. So I kind of doubt this whole, this whole thing from the show. I think we can kind of just toss it. Um, yeah. And how would you be able to tell? Like, even if they do have gender, like, how do you identify the, the, the gender of a fairy species? Like, <laughs> like it's not the same you don't look for the same things like <laughs> do you have it's like the barbie movie like no we don't have we don't have parts you can't <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing down there y'all <laughs> yeah. they're just i Ken. do i have all the parts I think they're all just ken <laughs> they're all kens yeah the others are kens <laughs> yes <laughs> wait isn't it no it's mattel not kenner that was a different uh, pro- <laughs> toy maker right anyway Notice how all meta this is, not the Barbie stuff. I mean, <laughs> just like lords, great and small, coming around and taking all the boys to go off to war. And sometimes they come back, but they're, they're changed, like they're traumatized and they're no longer that sweet boy you knew. They're some hardened killer uh, that's seen some shit and been through some shit. So mm, it's very similar. I mean, George, is, George, is a lot, George says he's not writing an anti-war novel, but there's a lot of anti-war stuff in there. You could, the themes are there. And he certainly doesn't love war. <laughs> and he says some, you know, he shows how, how destructive it is and how the cycle of violence plays out. It's true even in this supernatural setting or, or viewpoint. If you give them sons for their armies, they will be appeased, or so says Craster. Maybe it only takes animals. Maybe, maybe sheep are enough. Maybe they have to be male sheep. Aha. And of course, uh, you do have a chance of returning from war, I guess. But but as I said, often you're a very different person afterwards. But this, no, no chance at all of returning. Like if you give your son, your baby child to the others, there's no coming back from that at all. There is no even, not even a little bit. And unless you come back as another, which is still even more changed than a traumatized war veteran. Uh, Nina says there's a certain level of rights that Westerosi small folk have or are supposed to have given the system. You know, it doesn't always work out that way 
Yes, Westerosi feudalism is a deeply unfair and classist system, but the basic formula is that in return for the taxes and services provided by the small folk, the aristocratic class will protect the small folk in times of danger. Obviously, this does not always work out in practice, but it's also not the case that all Westerosi aristocrats are simply hard-hearted villains who treat the peasantry as their personal property. It's usually somewhere in between. Like, Ed Muir is a good example of someone who tried pretty darn hard to protect his people, whereas someone like Tywin, like, spends them like coins, you know? Like, a, a life is just another type of resource to him. Another thing to be spent for his benefit or his house's benefit. Uh, and the Starks maintain the winter town as a way to protect people from the cold in the winter. So there's there's certainly some good examples out there. The others, by contrast, don't seem to... There's no return. There's only we won't kill you. There's no benefit given back just other than you won't die. So, yeah. So this is kinslaying, of course. If you give away your kill children, that's kinslaying. Pretty straightforward. We've mentioned that way back at the beginning. Diwin said it. Diwin was right. You're giving away your own children. That's... That's kinslaying. <laughs> so let's talk about a little, let's talk a little bit about the, the John angle here. That the watch puts up with this, this arrangement. It's really tough for John to deal with this. He's really struggling with the morality of this. Quote: You knew. So, Smallwood told me long ago. All the Rangers know, though few will talk of it. Did my uncle know? All the Rangers, Mormont repeated. John can't really do much about it, though. He's a steward of the Lord Commander. What's he going to do? He, the best he can do is say, I'm not sleeping under this roof. He can only uh, exercise this in his own purview. He can't really make anyone else do it. But by the time he comes Lord, becomes Lord Commander, well, Craster's dead anyway, and John has no business going to that part of the world. At, at this point, he's got bigger problems. Interesting that Mormont learned it from Thorin Smallwood. But as we said earlier, Smallwood is a highly experienced ranger, He's probably slept at Craster's Keep a dozen times or something, and, and he, uh, he's a ranger. I mean, he be, like I said, he became acting first ranger when Benjen vanished. Uh, Nina says, "If if this is a go ahead, this is I don't know that that the, the, the it hits me really hard this moment, this realization that John has because he looks up to Benjen. He think John is has you said he has a strong sense of justice. He's trying hard to do the right thing. He thought it was the right thing to do to go to the wall." His uncle went to the wall. He wants to believe that he also has a strong sense. And Benjamin probably does have a strong sense of justice. But in the end, in the reality of the world, and I'm going to say in this part of the world which is built around conflict, hmm. justice just can't live there. You know what I mean? Benjamin knew it too. And for John to realize that is it's a tough wake up call like it was a tough wake up call for him to just getting to the wall and realizing the reality of it was very different than what he thought but still inside he was like okay well the wall isn't what i thought but justice is still important right my uncle is still a good man right well maybe not maybe not, not. as good as he you thought know, it's anyway, hard or yeah, yeah he's wrestling with that he's like well maybe he is maybe he maybe if benjamin had to do it maybe it's but no yeah that's really you're right he maybe really i have to do it too and right now he doesn't want to and again maybe benjamin or the wall have this bigger purpose. I think that was a quote somewhere else too, where they um, maybe I'm maybe I'm just thinking about that when when uh, Mormont tells him that our our war is more important than Rob's. Yeah, you know the the idea of this existential threat to humanity isn't as important as who's king right now. You know. Yeah. Um, and maybe an existential threat to humanity isn't as important as this guy murdering and raping his own family members. I, you know, I've, it, it's a t tough to believe that could be a scenario in the world right yeah. and usually in the real world that's not a scenario but in this fantastic world that's a scenario that's been set up for john and it's it's still tough for even if he does get clear evidence that we have to accept craster to save every other human on the planet it's, it's still a tough thing to accept yeah because it's not how he's was raised not what his sense of justice looks like it's just yeah it's a complete turnaround from from a lot of his values it's not the identity he thought that his family had either but we it's do see too yeah, like yeah we do see him making concessions to morality later. Like, he becomes Lord Commander, and what does he do? He does the baby swap. He makes Gilly yeah. leave her baby behind. Like, that. this John, Clash of Kings John would, would have thought that unthinkable. Yeah. I think. But, yeah. but Clash of Kings John was Stuart, not Lord Commander. Clash of Kings John hadn't gone beyond the wall and lived with Gilly and lived with the free folk and saw Corn Halfhand die and all these other things. And shot and saw innocent people die. All these, other, like... John has changed a lot since since these times, but he still has that sense of justice. But he's a little more 
worldly, uh, you know, at least his corner of the world, which does work differently than most of the rest of Westeros for a lot of reasons. By the way, it's a similar parallel I make to uh, to Stannis, oh, like yeah. the idea of Stannis burning a child or Melisandre, like right. But when there is this in this fantastic world where there really is magic and there really is this existential threat, at at what point do you? I don't know, forego that moral to save the world, you know? Yeah, that's a really tough question. <laughs> Speaking of someone who was willing to do things that may not have been moral for perhaps the greater good, the raven is always there. All these conversations John has with Mormon, that raven's always <laughs> there saying, you know, like we've quoted it a bunch of times. Like both Ashea and Sean have done a very good raven voice today. Yeah, <laughs> that's fun. So it's, that's quite possibly Blood Raven's hearing all this stuff going, yep, nope, nope. Like, God, Crest, are you guys like again with this guy? You know, <laughs> like <laughs> he's just like so frustrated sitting in his tree like someone chop that guy's head off you know? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not maybe he's like yeah they gotta do what they gotta do i get it i get it so craster claims the whites and others will not attack his keep because he's right with the gods and yeah like We've been saying it throughout the episode. The evidence does seem to appear to be true. The others do seem to leave him alone because of these sacrifices, leave his property alone because of th these sacrifices. Uh, though it's not really left alone, is it? If someone's coming by demanding sacrifices, of, and, and if, now, as we've said, Craster might be the one choosing to sacrifice his sons. He may not be giving them up be, uh, because he really thinks he has to. He's just telling that to his wives. Either way. That's not being left alone. <laughs> if someone's coming and demanding your stuff, it's not being left alone. Like they're they're not going to come kill you, but that's not the same as leaving you alone. They are absolutely d definitively not leaving you alone, <laughs> but they are not killing you. So that's definitely an important demand. And there's a lot of that here, isn't there? There's a lot of language used, manipulative language or semantics used by Craster to to justify his existence or to deflect criticism from the night's watch or from this and that or just to establish who he is so yeah that's a really important point about craster he has no power it's not a partnership it's not an arrangement it's it's a i'll, I'll you're taking something from me to leave me alone you see me as like a resource a recurring resource like you come threaten me get something out of it you're not killing me because you'd rather have that recurring thing than a one-time you know, take what you have and then that's it. You're like a, yeah, you're a, you're like a, a tree that bears repeated fruit. Like why chop down the tree that every year gives you more stuff. So that's what Craster is. Craster keeps giving them and not fruit, but people and sheep and dogs. And yeah. Lifessa sends a super chat and says, walkers would need a base nearby. So babies don't freeze before collection unless they don't need them alive. Or it's a chance. that's not that the white walkers taking them. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I still think the White Walkers are taking them because they've been seen by, apparently been seen by Gilly, but there is room for something else that they're just, Crasher's leaving them out there and that's not what's happening. Some just animals are taking them away and Crasher blames it on the White Walkers. The problem with that is that they're, they feel them coming, like that, that type of cold that they can tell is different. Like there's, I, the presence of them seems to be legitimate, even if the arrangement is, is, we're too, too much of it is Craster's own description i suppose there's a lot to play with here because this is a, a, a reasonable logistic point to bring up you know so maybe the walkers do appear periodically when the babies come but maybe also they have some minion that collects the baby and cares for it you know yeah um or maybe they have super fast horses or some sort of teleportation or tunnel system or there's all kinds of things yeah. yeah maybe they can control the temperature even though they have this cold aura about them maybe they can minimize the cold aura to keep the baby alive or something like that yeah maybe they feed on it instantly or maybe they just don't need them alive maybe yeah. they immediately consume the baby's life energy or whatever kind of like how melisandre can this making a spirit of a shadow baby from stannis can made him look older the next day uh mm -hmm. yeah. consuming a part of them yeah it's like a that's a they're feeding on a similar type of energy the shadow that creates the same shadow energy that, that can be formed into a assassin can also be consumed by other magical beings perhaps i mean those babies are shadow creatures and the others are shadow creatures there might even be some sort of it might fit into our grand magical overlap theory that they're a similar 
uh, sorcery is used to create them. Similar tapped energy within the, the world. A similar uh, rift in the dimensions has let them both through or whatever. We lack the right language for it, but I like that. Just, mm-hmm. I like that. The rift, dimensional rift or something. Yeah, they, they're pulled through with sorcerous energy. And yeah, that's why they don't quite fit in this world because they're not from it. <laughs> <laughs> Dornish Dame says the Knight's King slash Corpse Queen story hints that at the very least there have been female others in the past. And there have been stories of, you know, female others. Uh, I mean, uh, half human children, others, and, you know, siring, mating with others. By the way, it's uh, kind of a reversal. I think I, I think I skipped this note earlier. I'm going to come back to it. That Gilly, or Old Nan, says the wildlings kidnap women on the south side of the wall in order to give them to the others, which is probably not true. But it's kind of interesting in that it's the opposite of what Craster's doing. It's like Craster says, oh, they want the sons, but according to Old Nan, they want the women, which maybe it is either. And just some people think and Old Nan says they're taking women and the wild, she associates the wildlings with the others. So those are connected. But then Craster's made up the sons thing to for his own ends too. So maybe there's been a change in what the others want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Maybe it's connected to the red comment or although the red comment just now got here. It seems like Cracker's been doing this for a while, but that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, you can see that maybe at different times, the, uh, the others had different demands of humans and it connected to these other rises of magic. They want babies instead of sheep, male babies, instead of female babies, whatever. We need, we need stronger energy to make our comeback. <laughs> the sheep are just barely keeping us alive. <laughs> so let's talk about Craster's death and a few other related topics. The first time we see Craster, it's John's POV, although Sam is there. The second time we see Craster, it's Sam's POV. Not only is John not there, but Sam thinks John is dead. Let's go back to before this, though, for a little funny slash foreshadowy line from Dolores Ed. Quote. Give the wildling an axe. Why not? <laughs> He pointed out Mormont's weapon, a short haft battle axe with gold scroll work inlaid on the black steel blade. He'll give it back, I vow, buried in the old bear's skull, like as not. Not quite, but in the neighborhood. It wasn't, that's not quite what happened, but Craster was holding the axe, getting ready to swing it at Dirk before Allo grabbed him from behind and cut it. No, actually, it was thinking the other way around. He was going for Allo and Dirk cut him. Yeah, Dirk killed him. Yeah. That's right. And uh, by the way, that axe sounds pretty sweet. It sounds kind of like the, the Kraxen axe from TV. Gold and black with gold scroll work. Yeah, it sounds cool. So he is, yeah, he's holding that axe threateningly. Mormont suggests the name Answered Prayer for the axe, like you said earlier, Sean. But only in the context of if Craster's, one of Craster's wives uses it to kill him while he's passed out drunk, which he is at that moment when, when Mormont says it. Like, he, we, gave, we gave him wine, which he likes. He doesn't have access to much of that, you know. And he's passed out like... There is no way he's going to stop you. You could absolutely kill him right now. But, of course, they won't because they're convinced that they're doomed without him. They're convinced they're doomed without his sacrifices. We're not actually sure what happened to that axe. I'm curious. But it probably ended up with one of the mutineers hopefully killed (laughs) because most of those mutineers were killed. And Nina says this axe is also a little symbolic of the attitude of this towards this passive evil that the Night's Watch has to put up with in order to perhaps survive. I mean, it's, it's like we've said, it's been the difference between life and death sometimes, according to certain rangers anyway. Marmot will give the weapon and alcohol to Craster and speak about how the women should kill him, but he won't actually do it himself. The old tradition of Craster as a friend of the Watch outweighs that, and not to mention his own beliefs and guest right. Like, Mormont is legitimately mortified when Craster is killed. He's like, Oh my God, the gods will curse us. Like, he's not like, oh, this is a bad thing. You shouldn't have done that. No, he's like, he, he it's like a, a moment of belief. Like he's devout, like has, this is a really sincere belief he holds. And it's set up by a couple other comments he makes about the gods earlier. Like when they're a white tree, he says, my Lord father believed you couldn't tell a lie in front of a heart tree. And John says, my father believed the same. And it's like these things, this sets up Mormont being sincere and truly believing these things that he's saying about guest right which is it goes a long way towards explaining why he won't intervene that doesn't necessarily make it okay but like it's hard to go against deeply held religious beliefs 
it, it brings up questions about guest right. If I go to your house one time, you offer me food, I eat it, then I leave. When I come back to your house the next time, yeah. is it the same deal or can I, you know, like, good question. Uh, <laughs> it seems like you should show up, not accept his food and chop his head off with an ax, yeah. not worry about the guest right thing. <laughs> Yeah, Nina says, not only does Mormont recognize the insidious layers of abuse Craster has inflicted on these women, not only are they physically assaulted by Craster on a regular basis, but they have been raised to believe that they are pariahs to both the other free folk and the Night's Watch, and that's the only thing standing between them and destructive gods is Craster himself. Like, they're presented, he tells them that no one else will take them in also. It's not only that he's the only one to protect them, but they have nowhere else to go. And uh, that part's at least somewhat true. Uh, not for Gilly, as it turns out, thankfully, but... When it all breaks down, like, those other 18 women are left there to their own devices with the worst of the remaining Night's Watch, and, and they had a horrible fate, most likely. So the, the Night's Watch did not save them. They saved one of them and the child. And under unusual circumstances. Yes. Under different circumstances, Gilly would not have necessarily been uh, accepted at the wall or else That's true. That's very, very true. Yeah, you're right. Ed also, in as part of his conversation, jokes that it's a good thing Craster will be given wine because, well, at least he's less dangerous when drunk. That's a, a one few positive things. Hey, Ed, see, Ed can point out positive things. He's not all dolorous all the time, <laughs> but just most of the time. But it turns out being relaxed and drunk turned around when he was triggered. He became kind of reckless. I mean, I don't know. He goes to recap. Remember, he, he some of the survivors get mad at Craster for holding back food. Craster gets mad in return at their lack of, you know, respect for his generosity. He doesn't have to give them anything. He gets mad and kicks out the ones who insulted him. He's very specific. He's like, you insulted me, you, the rest of you can stay. You didn't say anything. Like, he doesn't treat them as a monolith. But then one of them calls him bastard. And that that really bothers him because he is one, but he hates being called that. So we, that's, by the way, why we said it's important to know that he's a bastard because it, it, it triggered him here. And that means those other times when it comes up, when he's making that comment to John about being a bastard and how Mance is a bastard and how he's one, it's it's a touchy subject for him and he's drunk. So there's more weight to it than you might realize. Yeah. And, but then we do realize. Yeah. It. <laughs> then we do realize it. So he, he loses his temper. He sweeps the food off the table, grabs the ax, jumps over the table and goes after Clubfoot Carl. Then Dirk grabs him from behind, cuts his throat. Mormon is horrified. All hell breaks loose. Nina says, let's be clear, Craster was barely, if at all, following the strictures of guest right. He was giving them food, but a really tiny amount. It was like he was technically helping them, but he was trying to just barely, you know, do the minimum. A bare minimum is the right way to put it. I, I even want to maybe give some credit to the fact that he does have a couple dozen people there that he needs to have food for. Yeah. And he can't let 50 soldiers show up and eat his winter reserve. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. There, there's so, some, on some level, you got to say, yeah, he's, he's got to say, he does have to save enough food for himself. And, and it is going to be, a look looks like a nasty winter. Those are facts, I think. Yeah. Here's another thing too, though, this idea that Crasser's never turned away someone from the night's watch. And so he's their friend. Do they have to give him wine and an axe every time? <laughs> what if what if they didn't give him the wine and axe? Would he turn him away the next time? Mm, maybe. maybe. You know, yes, is it exactly. pure generosity or is it is he getting something from the Night's nice Watch for this? Are they they're getting at stuff, least yeah. incidentally contributing to Crasser's scenario? You're right because he's profiting, basically from paying him each time. You yeah, know? this is and this is what he does. This is this is how he profits from his arrangement with the others. It's even though it's an awful thing. Like who would try seek a profit from this? Well, this guy would. Yeah, he's profiting from guest right even. These are things you're supposed to give freely, but he basically demands these if these gifts aren't given, that yeah, he probably wouldn't do it, you know. Now, that's to be fair. Those are also you're supposed to give gifts to your host. That is part of it. They gave him a crossbow some prior visit we're we're told and a crossbow is real valuable, like super valuable. Uh so anyway, Neat also points out though who drew steel first. It was Craster. Craster's the one who picked his axe up. Like, that guy called him a bastard, but he didn't, like, draw his dagger and call him a bastard. He just yelled that insult. Rude, but Craster drew steel first. Yeah, the penalty for rudeness shouldn't be death. So, yeah, right? guest right, <laughs> the, 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 the rules of guest right are not, don't include rudeness. I mean, you're supposed to be, yeah, not bring murder into their home, you know, these other things. It's pretty, yeah, rudeness is not quite, doesn't quite rise to that level. <laughs> like, we should, you should be gracious to your host but <laughs> maybe not every host and then of course once hell breaks loose they treat everything as theirs including the women it's a bit ironic for a man who considers himself so godly someone who sacrifices to the others to be killed 
by the Night's Watch, the eternal foe of the others, and the ones that fathered him. I mean, come on, man. You crows are fighting the wrong evils here. Like, <laughs> yeah, Craster's bad, but you guys are right, dropping right down to his level with some of this stuff. I mean, you just go do the same things that we're all saying are wrong. Like, he's raping his women. Like, that's the thing that is wrong. Like, come on, don't do that. Jeez. But these are the worst members of the Night's Watch. These are the guys, some of these are the same ones that were planning on murdering their brothers to escape. Like, one of these guys was, several of these guys were the co-conspirators with Chet. And, um... They all had a person they were going to murder. <laughs> so now maybe Craster was so reckless and charging Dirk. I mean, Allo, because maybe it's probably because he was drunk and confident. Maybe he just really thought he was immune because of Gesser. He's like, no, this surely the Night's Watch won't do this. You know, and he just got a little, got a little arrogant, got a little uh, ahead of himself there with that. No, these, and look, he knew how bad these people are. Uh, we don't know where Dirk is from, by the way. I would guess not from the north. <laughs> I would guess that he would maybe not have been so willing to do that if he was from the north, but maybe he was. Him and the other eight, eight of the other rogue knights watch stay at Craster's. They're the ones who steal the food and do all that awful stuff to the women. One of them dies like right away, falling out of a uh, the, the cellar, trying to climb up there. He falls and breaks his neck. I kind of hope one of the women knocked him down. And he did. I, I would That's prefer what I that too. to being to yeah. slipping. But we don't know. Uh, and Cold Hands kills five more of them later. So, and then, of course, Bran and Mira and Jojen eat them <laughs> unwillingly and unknowingly. But, hey, it's another example of having to, your morals uh, have to, you can't have as many morals when you're dying. You know, <laughs> so this is, you got to eat, right? So, uh, I, I don't know if Dirk was one of the five killed by Cold Hands. It would be really appropriate, though, if... He was killed by an agent of the old gods after violating guest rights so brutally. That would be fitting, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it indeed? Yes, yes, it would. Here's a cool, uh, as we work our way towards the end of the episode, we're not quite there, but here's a great part that I alluded to at the beginning. Nina wrote us a couple paragraphs about parallels between A Song of Ice and Fire and Fever Dream. Now, Fever Dream, as I said at the beginning, is set in 1857, Along the Mississippi River and around New Orleans in the U.S. It's a great book, a vampire novel. And in the story, the vampires fall into two very distinct groups. While some very vampires want a positive relationship with humans where they don't feed on them, other vampires call human beings cattle and consider them their natural prey. Uh, and by the way, this was written in 1982, so more than 10 years before he even started A Song of Ice and Fire. But as we're going to see in this, re in this uh, description and write-up that Nina has made here, uh, there are parallels. If some of that sounds like George was thinking about these vampires, particularly uh, the sinister half, the, the ones that see them as cattle, as inspiration for the others, well, yeah, here we go. Like the others, the vampires of Fever Dream are uniformly pale and inhumanly beautiful. Like the others, the vampires move with an unnatural quietness, grace, and elegance. Like the others, the vampires are far stronger physically than the humans. Like the others, the vampires cannot exist in daylight. Now, all these things are fairly normal for vampires, but you may not have noticed how similar that is to the others. It, what does all this have to do with Craster, though? You might have to be you might be asking. Well, that question is answered by the secondary antagonist of Fever Dream, a man called Sour Billy Tipton. In this in the novel, Billy served as an overseer on a plantation that the evil group of vampires moved onto and eventually took over. The novel makes it pretty clear that Billy was already a bad guy before the vampires ever moved in, and he certainly had no problem being an abusive enforcer of slavery on the plantation. However, once the vampires take control of the plantation, Billy becomes what the novel calls a thrall. We've all, if you know anything about vampires, the term thrall is nothing new. Or might you, or what you might also call a familiar, which you probably have also heard. Like Guillermo in What We Do in the Shadows, he's a familiar. But in other contexts, he might have been called a thrall. He's more of a familiar because he's not truly, he's got a lot of agency. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I got to mix a little humor in here because this stuff is pretty dark. When the vampires want to feast on an enslaved young woman, Billy is the one who purchases her and holds her up so the vampires can drink her blood. When the vampires have to hide from the sunlight during the day, Billy protects their residents from sunlight, puts up curtains and does all these other things to make sure they don't die while the sun's out. So he's, and it's, a, but it's also a one-sided relationship. Billy serves the main vampire antagonist, Damon Julian, because he believes, and Damon has told him so, though it's a lie, that he will one day turn him into a vampire himself. But Billy 
never gets that. It's never, it never happens. There's no benefit to him in the long run. They've totally used him to be their go between, between humanity and them. He's their slave catcher, their bait finder. So he's truly turned against his own kind for a deal that he should be able to suss out is never going to happen. He should be able to figure out that they're lying to him, but he wants it badly enough. He's perhaps evil badly uh, on his own badly enough to want this so much that he's willing to believe it. He brags about how the vampires are superior and how he's going to be one one day too. So he treats humans coldly. He treats them just, you know, he, he, he's severe towards disloyalty, very threatening when Billy is dying and begs Julian to say, finally turn him into a vampire, Damon laughs and at him and informs him that actually vampires can't make humans into, into other vampires, <laughs> sucka. <laughs> and then he watches him die. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Sorry. I told you to read the book and then we go ahead and tell you this part. Anyway, that's not a, not that crucial of a moment. You know, like the, when the secondary villain dies, like, yeah, you probably saw that coming. Maybe not the exact way, but doesn't that sound a lot like Craster? Like Billy Crasher has no qualms about commanding a household of enslaved people and doing whatever the evil people want in, in exchange for. It's like the underpants gnomes. Step three, profit. <laughs> there, but there is no. Yeah, but there is no profit. <laughs> Just as Billy gave human flesh in the form of enslaved people to Damon Julian and his fav fellow vampire, so Crasher gives the others human flesh in the form of his own enslaved sons. Just as Billy is proud to serve the antagonistic vampires because they give him a sense of importance and protection, so Craster confidently declares himself a godly man protected by his gods. But it's all a lie. They're all just using him. Just as Billy's relationship was with Damon Julian, it's one side. In the end, Billy was no more than a slave himself to Damon Julian. He just didn't know it. Uh, Craster doesn't al also doesn't realize that he's more never uh, more than a slave to the others. He says they were left alone. We were right with the gods. That's why we're left alone. Yeah, get right with the gods and you'll be left alone. But as we pointed out, his definition of left alone is I just don't agree with it. <laughs> it's that's not left alone. You know, the others did not care that Craster was killed during the mutiny at his keep. We're not going to take revenge on his behalf. There's not no comeuppance for anyone else in that regard any more than Damon julian cared what happens to his human thralls they're just a, a thing to have for a while to use up and when they use up you go get another one cattle just like he said at the beginning only good for feasting or enslavement to the others same thing yeah i don't think and this is the other clue damon believes or, or billy believes that the vampires can make him a vampire Think about that here. Craster believes the sons are being turned into more others. Well, it's entirely possible that's complete bull. Even if that was possible at some day, like the others had to come from somewhere. Whether his sons are actually being turned into it, quite possibly a full-blown lie, full lie. Similar to Damon Julian lying to Billy about being able to make him a vampire. It's like, no, actually, you can't do that. <laughs> or we don't have the power you know, to do that. <laughs> one quick thought. It might not be a full-blown lie. Craster might believe it and just not actually know what's going on. That's true. He might have pieced that together or someone else told him and he believed it or something yeah. like and that. And he's so. not personally being expected to turn into another. So it's not like he expects that benefit personally. So that is another small difference. So both John, uh, by the way, great right up there. I really appreciated that. I hadn't read that book in so long. There's no way I would have remembered all those parallels. So thanks, Nina. Very good. Both John and what, what was the name of that book again? Fever Dream, but spelled F-E-V-R-E, -E, not F-E-V-E-R. Like fever, the fever river in the north is spelled that way. So it's a nod to, oh. especially because mm. it's a river, but it takes place on the Mississippi. The, pretty much the whole story. You sure it's not Fevre? Fevre. <laughs> Brett Fevre dream. <laughs> <laughs> the Fevre dream. Yeah, Fevre dream. So uh, George is, um, one of George's production, isn't it George's production company called Fever River? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's also got High Garden Entertainment. A lot of his, like, sub companies have game of thrones names or or in this case fever dream name <laughs> so both john and sam have all this information because they experienced craster's keep and as i said earlier gilly does too and more she's something of an untapped source of knowledge here and, and since she's still out there still alive with sam she might say more things that m would make us want to come back to this topic and add to it at some point there's a few other survivors like gren and ulmer and dolorous ed that I've seen some things as well. They might they might weigh in. They might matter. Those, those three are currently all alive. 
through his child, Craster also plays a role in the as yet unresolved replaying of the Tower of Joy scenario. We mentioned that briefly, just something that John, younger John would not have done, but Lord Commander John killed the boy. The one who killed the boy is swapping boys. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so Craster's child is in Old Town. Like, that's a strange place for Craster's child to end up, but that's where we're at because Dalla's babe was uh, left there. Yep. So, yep, yep, yep. Oh, wait. Did I get that backwards? I got that backwards. I got that backwards. Gillian Craster's son is still at the wall. <laughs> yeah. Gillian Craster's son is still yeah. at the wall. And Gilly, I even have it written correctly here. I just said it wrong. Dalla and Mance Raider's son is the one she brought to Old Town, the one that isn't hers. <laughs> right. But that's also very interesting. Yes. For <laughs> yeah, that doesn't to undo the Old interesting County. aspect of it and how yeah. similar it is to the Tower of Joy in reverse. Like, what, send, send one north, leave the other south. Except, yeah, there isn't necessarily two babies in the first scenario. But there is a, a hidden identity here. So we'll have to see what happens there. It could be a really awkward similarity where you, instead of being sacrificed to the others, it's just sacrificed to Melisandre instead. Like literally out of the frying pan into the fire, literally out of the freezer into the frying pan. What is it? <laughs> Not quite literal, pretty close. So, yeah. And that's our episode, folks. Really enjoyed talking about Craster, as creepy as that subject is. The mysteries and the stuff about the others is a really fun topic the trivia question yes 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 the question was who does john see sleep in a tree you made a joke to sean you said a big person his name is giant but he's oh. it's one of those reverse nicknames i think a shay made that joke oh, shay made that. oh my bad i'm sorry yeah. shay made that joke <laughs> you were writer than you knew or did you know were you doing that on purpose i wasn't doing that on purpose you, you said you said you said for the whole thing i was like picturing like well it's other but as we know giant is five feet tall it's a it's a nickname like little you know little kevin or whatever (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah little walder exactly so uh that's a thing yep so that's there you go that's the answer to that and scrolling back here like I said, next week we're off. We'll be, we'll be putting up an, an older episode. Some of y'all might not have uh, seen it, so definitely keep your eyes on the feed. But then after that, we'll be launching into Valar Arenas for Fire and Blood. That should be a lot of fun, a lot of rabbit holes, a lot of great discussions. We're diving right into the text, y'all. I can't wait. Uh, some episodes that we mentioned during this one that you might want to consider if you want to stay in this general topic area. Basically, our entire Religion and Magic series from way back, The Comet, Night's King, the Werewood episode and the Werewood tour episode. So a lot of related topics to this one, especially the Werewood stuff, but Night's King too, pretty much. And we mentioned the Comet as well. The Pact as well might be relevant, eh, depending on where you're thinking, what you're thinking about. And the Children of the Forest episodes. There's some Valar readers for the World of Ice and Fire ones that we did only about a year and a half ago. So check those out if you want to, or haven't already, especially if you haven't already. But a lot of them are fun to re-listen to as well. Thank you to those of you who support us on Patreon or Spotify. That is very much what we require to continue existing. You know, that's the world we live in. You gotta make a living in order to do what you do. And we rely on y'all. We are, our sponsors are inconsistent. It's, it's good to have, but we can't rely on it. But we do rely on y'all. So take advantage of our special $2 sign up for Patreon. You can lock that price in forever. As long as you keep uh, consistent with it, as long as you stay on and, d- and don't uh, fall off, you'll lock that price in forever. Get all our bonus content and other things for the foreseeable future. And that's great because the price is going up to five. So you'll be spending less than half of that. Big shout out to Nina. A lot of great notes today. Goodqueenally.tumblr.com is where to find her as always. Thanks as well to Joey, Jesse, and Bran for the music and intro stuff that we have. We're really proud of, of, of those. We love our music and our intro. Thanks as well to Michael Klarfeld for the maps, as well as our older video intro, which we also love very much. Claradox with a K dot D-E is his website. You can buy downloadable copies of the maps, which you can go take to a print store and have printed out. That's what we do. Noticing he's working on a Stormlight Archive map. Right That's now. right. Shay is muted. Oh, you're muted. I said, notably, he's working on a Stormlight Archive map right now. 
um, which is a different fandom. It's Brandon Sanderson, and he has done other fandoms in the past because he has like a Witcher map and, and whatnot. Um, D&D, perhaps. I forget. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So Michael, busy as always, doing great things. We'll keep you abreast if you aren't following him directly, but I do recommend you doing that. And also thanks to our Benjineer. Named so after a character who came up several times this episode. He was unlike named. the Benjineer, we know where... Oh, I mean, sorry, unlike Benjin, we know where the Benjineer lives. <laughs> yeah, just like the idea. I was like, that's like named for Ben... I never thought about Benjineer being like a Benjin. Like all this time, I just was like, okay, Ben and Engineer. Oh, you didn't? That's funny. I never thought of the Benjin part of it. <laughs> yeah, that's part of why I love it so much. It's a multifaceted, <laughs> fitting nickname. You hear that, Benjineer, nice as you're editing this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. Anyway, we'll see you all soon for Valar Reedus Fire and Blood. And you know what to do before that. Valar Reedus!